recorded in the posterity. Um, next week we're meeting again on Friday, and we have a um, compromise between the I think between the Justice Oversight Committee and the Joint Fiscal Committee on the language for um, the uh, well, I'm going to call it the Women's Prison. Um, correctional. correctional facilities. So we're going to hand out, Captain's going to hang, hand out that language, and Mike is, right. to all of us. And, but we won't take it up until next Friday yes. at 10 a.m. So if you have questions about it, you can either call Catherine, Chris Cole, or anyone. It's, it says the proposed motion at the top. There's no title on it, so that yeah. is, um, it's that's where I'm going to the bottom, just so you know where you can find So briefly, it, it is a compromise. Jane Kitchell worked on it, uh, and I think Alice has got it. So we will we'll take it up next week, but I didn't have time on this week, so then I didn't that. So it says proposed motion. Oh, it's right here in our package? That's the bottom page of your package. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So can I just ask for clarification? Just because you and I are in the Council of State Governments working group on Justice Reinvestment to yep. on Monday. Yes. And this language here does not replace the work of Justice Reinvestment to in the no. Council of State Governments. It works in tandem with that. No. And also, because it deals a lot here with programming, which CSG can weigh in on. But CSG also does not look at doing any analysis of facility models or site locations of correctional facilities. That's not their role. Their role is programming. This does not take away. They may suggest that we be better off with 30 women in transitional housing than in the prison. They may suggest we be better off with 30 men in transitional housing, too, and not in prison. That they could come up with all kinds of suggestions based on the data. But that doesn't, we have to act on those suggestions anyway. So it doesn't preclude no. at all where we're just to be clear, All right, so next, next Friday at 10 a.m. Yep. Any questions? Um, at that time. So our first item on today is, is the uh, update on the Chin's working group. And I thought that it would be helpful to have Judge Grissom kind of go over the working group. But I wanted to make clear that uh, our focus is on the opiate crisis and the infant and toddler cases that are being seen in our courts that are backing up the defense, the prosecution, the court time, and taking away from other things that the court might be doing. And in particular, we had money put aside two years ago in the budget of year ago. last year. Last year in the budget. Uh, some nine million dollars. Seven. Seven. Seven million. I'd like to inflate. Um, would take nine. But yeah. it was only seven. Um, to come up with some ideas. The committees approved some, didn't approve other proposals from the working group. So I thought it'd be good for us to get an update on that. I don't want to step on the toes of the Child Protection Committee, which is also looking at the chin's problem. So with that, uh, okay. I think I can hopefully bring on one of the point. We see the statistics from Franklin County, for example, which are so high as compared to the rest of the state and even when compared to Chittenden County. Um, and those are some of the things that I thought we could better understand. So I don't know if by the end of my talk or anyone else's this morning will better understand, but I, I will tell the committee that that's one of, one of hopefully our focus uh, of the Chin's Reform Group, and I can explain that in more detail. Uh, but for the record, uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, 
uh, reporting on the uh, Chins Reform Group. Uh, I can tell the committee that we have met uh, twice uh, since the session ended. Um, and I think to, to try to outline a, a plan to go forward on the um, areas that were approved by the legislature. Um, and one of our, uh, our last meeting also included um, contact that I think Ken can go in, will probably go into more detail than I will, uh, with the Arizona courts on some ideas for uh, future requests to the legislature around the idea of um, um, mediation. Um, but in short, so the committee understands where we are, there are actually three items that were approved in the last legislative session. The first was a home visiting study. Um, we have uh, identified an individual, Kay Johnson, who will be doing that study uh, for us, and we expect that contract with her uh, to be finalized uh, this week, and we hope she starts her work either in, uh, by mid-September, uh, late September, and we hope to have a report from her uh, before the end of the year on that, on that subject. Um, and as I said, Ken uh, Schatz may have some more uh, detail on that. But that is the first piece. That was about $25,000, and so we're going ahead with that, and we expect that process to start, as I said, within a week or two. Uh, the second piece that I would refer the committee to was the so-called systems evaluation. That was $125,000 to look at the uh, system as a whole and make recommendations. Obviously, that's a much bigger uh, project than the home study. Uh, within our office and the court administrator's office, we put together an internal group to uh, look at the services, the consultants, the entities that could conduct uh, that type of evaluation consistent with the uh, legislation that was passed. So we're still trying to identify. Refresh my memory here. Wasn't that also to look at other states? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Because other states, uh, like New Hampshire came to mind, and Maine, I think. We were. The idea, I, I don't know, I have that language right in front of me, but it speaks to um, looking not only at, at what we're doing, but what other states are doing. Um, and I, I think the words, if I can put my fingers on it. No, that's okay. But it, it is, it, it's supposed to be a broad look at how we are structured and how other states have done it, and is there a way to do the process differently. Um, so that obviously is a much more involved project, but we um, are in the process of trying to identify uh, the entity that could provide that service, um, and also looking at the procurement process, whether it's going to be by contract or whether uh, we have to uh, put out an, an RFP uh, to start that process. Once we've identified uh, the entities we think can do this, we obviously the judiciary will be talking with the other uh, members of the Chen's Reform Group uh, under the, the legislation. We need to consult with them, so it's not going to be just our decision. Um, and we hope to get that process started so at least we can identify the entity uh, within this calendar year um, and start that process. Um, the, the final piece that was approved um, by the legislature this year was uh, the um, hiring of a, of a judicial master and related staff. And that's coming up at 11.30. Yes, so I won't go into a lot of detail now other than to tell you, um, and I should have uh, made note at the beginning, I have filed with the committee, you should have uh, the year-end statistics for fiscal uh, 2019 in front of you. Um, the, the figures that I think you were referring to, Senator Sears, showing the numbers in um, Chilton County and Franklin County, the oh, charts right yeah. there. Oh, so you have those figures, and I've also provided the committee with uh, the um, job description for the judicial master, and I would just tell the, the committee, without going into a lot of detail on that um, position, that we are uh, hopeful of uh, working out the details uh, with the Department of Human Relations in terms of identifying the type of position it is and hopefully start that hiring process within the next week or two. Um, the 
th those are the three areas that the legislature had approved funding for. Um, the funding for the judicial master calls for a, uh, the use of a judicial master in a multi-county region, and it also provides for staff support for that position. Um, and we have identified uh, Chittenden and Franklin County as the proposed pilots, and I can go into detail now or later when we talk about the judicial master as to why we um, arrived at that point. The, the other area that the legislature did not approve this session um, that all of the members of the Chins Reform Group are interested in discussing further, not necessarily today, but letting the committee know that we're interested in the coming session and talking more about the concept of the use of mediation in the Chins process. Um, in particular, uh, we talked with uh, folks from Arizona who have had significant success uh, in that process, um, as much as 90% of the cases are resolved somewhere along the lines. And we think it's uh, an area that certainly needs further discussion. And so we look forward in the coming session to talk more about that. One thing I've been thinking of more and more is the cost for people to go to court today um, and the fees of that. Have we done any look at, have we gone too far? We, what do you mean well, by Well, in terms of the cost, I, I was talking to somebody last night and said, you know, every time my son, the person that I contacted you about, he thanked us, thank you for your advice, by the way. Um, but, you know, have we done any look at why does it cost him $140 every time he wants to make a motion to, to Depending on what the motions are, I mean, though yeah. that's the fee structure, um, and I, off the top of my head, I don't know what the, I, the fees are, yeah. but that's, that's the process. I've been wondering more and more, and, I, and also, uh, I thought at some point we ought to take up the issues of driving and license suspended again. Um, the cost of some of these fees are exorbitant in comparison with the, with the fine. Um, they are, and I can tell the committee that on a, on a related matter, we met earlier this week to discuss the surcharge system. Yeah. That, that um, you know, something, there are certain entities that are funded right. to a great extent by that. When we, when we um, legalize marijuana, it cost one group $80,000 in funding that they were getting funded through the, the tickets from the marijuana surcharge. I think it was... It, if it's the surcharges, uh, those, are, of course, are uh, imposed by the legislature. The we can't waive them. Yeah, it probably was the version. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was sitting in. Uh, so it makes you question. I was sitting in uh, Newport last week, and a fellow came in with a, a plea agreement, and there were four pages of the plea agreement, three charges on each page, and every one of them carried one hundred and forty-seven dollars <throat> in surcharges. Um, so. That's just one one case, but we have no authority. We have no, no ability to waive those. So it's a, it's a matter of legislature and the administrative branch, but we should be taking a look at this in terms of justice. Um, That's a quick summary of, of right. where we are at this point. What we hope to talk to the legislature about in the coming session. Um, Would you make note of that for a future meeting to talk about surcharges, particularly in terms of? like license suspension and how people get themselves into a mess mm -hmm. very, very quickly with maybe one night's uh, activity. Maybe, maybe we could have kind of a general discussion, not just of the surcharges, but the array of fees that are in place. You know, I, I am at, we just added a fee to offenders for under supervision. We increased that. So it's mm -hmm. at the beginning of the system all the way through to the end of the system. Right. To know what those fees are funded. Well, anyway, it, it, it's not your fault. 
it, it's certainly a, a topic that we have Instead been discussing. Instead of funding some things, functions of government out of the general fund, we've been funding them out of the exactly. charges and fees. And that's the discussion we had with this group the other day. It's all of the folks that have an interest in specifically in surcharges and what amounts they're getting at it. I'll just give you rough numbers of this group that was there, the uh, S SI units, yep. special investigation units, uh, the, the uh, uh, crime victims, restitution. Um, and I forgot who else was at the table. About three and a half million dollars um, in, in surcharges that on a quick number that is coming from strictly from surcharge, $147 every time. I kind of go to shop subjects. So. Mm -hmm. well, well, we'll see how you're going to discuss it later. Well, I remember we had a bill on our committee a few years ago introduced uh, pertaining to folks who have DLSs and to forgive um, past charges or so they could be reinstated. And part of the issue was their license couldn't be reinstated until they paid all the charges that had accumulated. And that was what was holding them back. That interest and penalties. Right. And it was so complicated and so many layers that we didn't do. Remember that? That was like two years ago. Particularly here, people coming out of uh, uh, corrections. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. So get them back into the. We went a little off the subject. But it's all those surcharges yeah. yes. that have yes. accumulated yes. that prevents them from going forward when they re-enter. That's yes. the same. One more question. Yeah. Um, Judge, if you can just help me understand the process. I'm, I'm feeling a little frustration, and this is an urgent issue that we're talking about, and it seems like it's taking a while to get there. And, and particularly the systems evaluation. Um, and and I, 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 you know, we're here in the winter time, and we have great ideas and expect things to be completed by the time we get back. But it feels like it's taking a long time, given the urgency of the problem. There's no question about the urgency of the problem, and, and everybody on the, on the Chin's Reform Group recognizes that. Um, the process, of course, until the legislative session was over, um, that's we, we couldn't take any action until then. And so we have met, um, as I said, twice, and we recognize uh, the need to move forward on that. But that's a bigger project than, than the other two, which are individual positions. They had some proposals, and we rejected many of their proposals, and so... It really wasn't until the end of the session, as the senator saying right. that... So this is what passed through. Their proposals were... I, I, I don't remember all of them, but yeah. they had a number. Yeah. Ken Schatz could speak to some of them. They were looking at um, things like uh, having uh, somebody attached to each turning point center that would help the parents. Um, so I remember. I, I appreciate that during the session it was an iterative process and that, yeah. it, that it took to the end of the session, but if I understood you correctly, the, um, the contract for the systems evaluation, you're not sure if you'll award it until the end of this calendar year. I, I, I hope we can do it sooner than that. I, I, that's all I can tell you at this point. Is we, we really want to get that process started, applying the entity and the procurement process um, is a little more time consuming than I appreciated. I will probably say that for myself. Yeah, I'm sure it's equally frustrating for you. It's just the end of the year, it will probably be another six months or a year before we see something and we're now into the second half of the next biennium before we're able to act on your recommendations. It's a long time for such an urgent sure. problem. They, they might say that partly our fault. Yeah. Well, so maybe we all ought to um, that, all given all the all urgency all. of this. Maybe it would be good if this committee could make some recommendations for the future spending of the $7 million before we get into session and go through the budget. So if there are other proposals that, that the committee could look at, say, in our December meeting or November meeting. And I we do, that's a great we do appreciate the concern, and we recognize the urgency. So that we make recommendations to the 
the committees on you know, that are involved in this area, appropriations, health and welfare, human services. The entire <laughs> no, um, just Not close. Well, we'll, make a, we'll, we'll send you a copy. Um, thank you, Judge. Thank you. Ken Shatz. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Good morning. Ken Schatz, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. I uh, look forward to, to meeting you, uh, Mr. Nash. And uh, go going forward, I do want to, again, start by appreciating this committee's attention on this issue. It is urgent. It is extremely important that we address um, what I perceive to be a child welfare crisis in our state. Um, the, the, the challenges are immense. The fact that you created the working group, again, I think is a, a very positive step. And we did work hard. And as, as uh, Senator Sears indicated, we did our best to make some recommendations recommendations in response to your request. I appreciate the, the process that some of those recommendations have not been accepted and, and some have and we all want to move forward um, together as uh, efficiently and expeditiously as possible. And so I'll, I'll start by um, uh, appreciating again the particular focus on the opioid crisis in infants and toddlers. As you know, we've talked about that a lot um, in terms of the challenges uh, to families in our state and, and in particular, how it's impacted the child welfare system. So the attention on that is really welcome, which goes to uh, the uh, the contract that uh, Judge Pearson mentioned with Kay Johnson. So as you may recall, the, the what you did approve was uh, in response to our recommendation related to home visiting, uh, that we do first a contract with somebody to re review both um, national models and Vermont models to make sure that if we're gonna go forward with something, it is one that's consistent with best practices. So Kay Johnson is actually a well-qualified expert who's actually done a lot of work in Vermont in the early care, learning, and health uh, arenas. And so I think that that is going to be really helpful um, in terms of enabling us to move forward. But it also, um, I'll just remind you about that initiative because that's just a contract to get us going. But that initiative recommendation, which you have not addressed yet in terms of whether or not you will support as a legislator, is recognizing um, that a combination of embedding a, a, a private a, um, family support person that is not the state, but maybe somebody from a parent-child center um, in a pediatric practice, and then having the ability to refer families to sustained home visiting is an approach that we believe really can make a positive, constructive difference in enabling families to address some issues related to opioids, related to other challenges and barriers uh, that sometimes lead to abuse and neglect. We do, wanna, we do see this as a prevention, early intervention approach. Um, it's building on some things you can take some credit for, which we have a, a really great system of um, um, newborns and parents going to their pediatrician within the first six months after a child is born. It's the, 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 the documents that we've seen indicate approximately 95% of newborns actually go to their first visit with a pediatrician, which provides us for an opportunity to make use of the pediatrician approach as a way to build um, avoidance and prevention of uh, an early intervention with respect to abuse and neglect. So we're building on that positive I'm hopeful that when we do come back in January, based on the recommendations from Kay Johnson, we will have a proposal for you to initiate um, some uh, embedding of uh, family support workers and sustained home visiting um, approaches in, in areas around the state, and I'm hopeful that you will support that approach with, um, as uh, Senator Sears mentioned, the money at least that you do have designated um, for this effort. So from my perspective, that's critically important uh, to, to move forward on. The other thing that uh, Judge Pearson mentioned that um, we have been working on is related to alternative dispute resolution. Again, that is not something that you supported. I don't know that you rejected it, although I can be educated. I think that you just weren't quite ready for it, um, is my interpretation. But I will you know, be glad to be uh, having further conversation about that. Um, as Judge Pearson um, indicated, we do think that that is a really important tool to have to try to enable some of these matters to move through the system. Um, 
um, in a uh, more collaborative manner in, and hopefully have better outcomes and results. So what we did was connect with um, a, a court-based program in Arizona that is impl implementing a child welfare mediation approach. And I'll step back for a second. It's not as if we don't have a very um, um, uh, robust mediation practice in Vermont in a very variety of areas, but what we've learned is that the child welfare issues are somewhat unique in terms of how you approach mediation. So it's not just a cookie cutter thing that if you've got a mediator, you can automatically just say, please do a child welfare case. What we learned in Arizona was that they have a system um, that is very um, uh, prescriptive in terms of how it operates. They put a lot of time and energy into thinking about how it would work. They use a staff approach um, th so that they do uh, have appropriate supervision, training, um, and monitoring of how it's working. They use something that they refer to as facilitated settlement conferences. Um, participation by parents is voluntary. It's not, it's, uh, not forced, but interestingly enough, what they told us was out of 1,200 cases in, um, in the particular county involved, approximately 1,100 families voluntarily participated. That is, almost all of the families who had this opportunity took advantage of it. And in fact, they were able to settle 85 to 90 percent of the cases through mediation, which again is an incredibly positive statistic in terms of the success. And even when the cases did not successfully resolve, they did have shorter court hearings because some of the issues were either clarified or reduced so that they could move through the system more expeditiously. So I, I give you some of that detail just to let you know we're working on it still. Um, that uh, my hope is again that we will come back in January and ask that you do fund uh, uh, us to be able to implement a child welfare mediation approach um, in Vermont. We think it has great potential. Could you um, think about having a proposal prepared, say, mid-November or even earlier, that would be able to be gone through by this committee at our December meeting, which is yet to be figured out when that would be. But it might be helpful to be able to have the committees know what's coming, and it might be a better process for everyone involved. I'm glad to work on that with the other members of the work group. I think that, that without turning around and looking to see, but I think that that is very doable to give you some sense of our thoughts about it. Yeah, I'm just thinking is that that way there we can make recommendations to the standing committees. And we can put that in the BAA even and maybe move it a little faster than waiting for the budget process. Can we do that again? <laughs> seems like every year, this is just a side note, every year the budget adjustments seem to take longer and longer. Sometimes we're, we're passing the budget adjustment just before the big bill. So maybe you just have to agree with us. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a budget adjustment capital bill. You can use that too. Uh, my speaker, <laughs> just a question about the home visiting. Sure. What's that going to look like? Is this going to be something that is all over the state? Or is it going to be a pilot program? So there are pockets of home visiting that actually are going on now. So what we had proposed, but it may be um, revised in light of the, the Kay Johnson report, so I want to be straightforward about that. But what we had envisioned was doing pilots in two counties to have an opportunity um, to see if it's actually, if we really want to look to see whether it works um, in our state with modality of, and approach that we implement. We don't, um, we don't want to assume too much too quickly. So the idea we proposed uh, initially was to do pilots in two counties. No, that's, this is separate from, that's the judicial masters, and it, did, it would not necessarily be the same. We haven't gotten there yet in terms of this uh, initiative, in terms of where. So then finally, I would just close by saying that I do appreciate the concern about the timing of the system of care report, and I'm just going to support Judge Grierson uh, as a department that has to work through our contract and grants uh, process. It is challenging, um, and I know that the judiciary is doing the best they can to move it forward. I'll share that we're doing our best at DCF to support the judiciary in terms of moving that forward. I just want you to know that um, I think we're all committed to, to moving forward as quickly as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um.
James Peppers. Senator Tears? Yes. Um, so I thought since you folks are talking a little bit about some of their earlier recommendations, um, we printed out a copy of, oh, of those for y'all and also the, um, the uh, language from uh, uh, the budget that um, created the working group. Just I thought you guys could see all the for your files. Hi, uh, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. So, you know, our, our Chin's group was conflicted, I think, about whether to really focus our efforts on the urgency of the immediate crisis in front of us, or whether to create proposals around sort of long-term prevention um, alternatives. And I think that what we decided, and I think you'll see we had proposals around both of those aspects that were kind of, you know, there's, I don't think any one of them was very focused, um, other than, um, but what we have now focused on is this kind of alternative dispute resolution and mediation, which seems to have been incredibly successful in resolving cases more quickly in Arizona. It's family-centric, family-led. Um, it's therapeutic and ultimately less traumatic for the children involved. Um, and it saved millions of dollars for the court system. I have some, there's a 2014 report which indicates just how much money has been saved in their uh, judicial budget initially. But they're not, I don't even think, calculating the kind of second and third level effects of you know resolving these cases quickly and the kind of um, intergenerational impacts of the trauma that these situations create. Um, so as Ken mentioned, you know, 95% of the Chins cases, they call them dependency cases out, out there, um, opt for some form of uh, mediation. We focused, it, mo focused mostly on the settle facilitated settlement conferences. Um, these are confidential so that nothing that's said in the conference can be used against any of the parties um, in later proceedings. Um, they provide uh, parents the ability to modify what's in the affidavits because oftentimes, you know, what's in the affidavit can be a very strict bone of contention for one party or another, and just a slight tweak might be the kind of breaking point that opens up future negotiations. Um, there are moderators or mediators, but these are self-directed um, by the family members. The mediator's job is to kind of work through the issues in a non-judgmental way, look at the kind of what's possible, what, develop a safety plan, um, help the parties understand what trial will look like, what the consequences are going to be, um, what issues will be important to a judge at a trial. Um, What's essential here is that they happen incredibly early in the process. There's a first meeting within 24 hours of a removal. Um, within six days of that, um, they're brought before a judge, and, um, and then the judge will set a future mediation um, within three weeks. And um, I think 65% of those 95 mediation cases come to some sort of resolution um, at that second meeting. So. It's just been, you know, it's a way to kind of get through the kind of contentious issues early on and not drag out this process. Can you give us, uh, I understand what you're saying, but so you have a couple who the state is proposing to have their child be in foster care or alternative care or be with one parent or another parent and the prosecutors involved, the states, the, judge, the judiciary involved, the defense provides an attorney. What are, I mean, how does that all get mediated when you've got all these different interests? That's, that's I, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding. I so see. this guy, I'll give you one example as a constituent who complained to me, drug addict. The mother is a drug addict, the father is a drug addict, but the father says, I'm clean now. I've been through this program and that program. Um, you know, why can't I have my kid? How do we mediate that? Uh, I don't think that every case is going to be resolved, but I'm, it's my understanding. No, I mean, yeah. I, but those are real, like, right. cases, no. and I'm curious as to how you mediate something like that. Well, I mean, can you give me an example of what gets mediated? 
I think you put you on the spot. Right. No, I, and I, it'd be, I, I would like to take that question back to the Arizona folks, but I think what gets resolved, you know, maybe not when. I, I, it's my understanding that at these mediations, you have the mediator, you have one or two family members. Um, sometimes they have separate mediations. You have an attorney for the child, and that's it. I, I mean, so you don't have the, and everything's confidential, so nothing can kind of be later used against uh, the members or the parties at a future proceeding. But you know, you're not, you're not having, you know, a, you know, all the attorneys present for all, all members. Um, and I think that the goal is to really think about what's best for this child and to work through the kind of, I guess, the, the low-hanging fruit issues and try and find some sort of common ground. You know, they base this on the getting to yes model of negotiation and, you know, with ultimately the kind of best interest of the child at heart. So I know that that's maybe a well, you know, rosy-colored look at the situation, when but... When I get the complaints from constituents and I send them off to Karen or Ken or somebody at DCF or Beth Sosmo. Um, you know, it's, it's always more complicated than what the person told me, number one. Mm -hmm. um, right. They can't tell me much, but they can tell me that there's more to the story yeah. than what you've got. Um, and I'm just not, I, I, that's part of the problem. I think when the working group came up with the mediation proposals last year, yeah. We see in real life situations, and we're trying to understand how it's going to work. Because you know, if they could already agree through mediation, um, yeah. the, the the people that call me don't. You know, a lot of times, it's grandma too. You know, I tell her you don't have any rights. Right. I know that uh, the parties to mediation usually submit for this kind of second, the facilitated mediation. A, um, a, a worksheet where they kind of list the problems and the kind of complaints that they have against the other party or, um, and so the mediator already has a lot of information going into where they disagree and then the mediator's job is to help them understand that, okay, even if everything you say is true, the judge will still find a dependency in Arizona or will still substantiate the Chin's claim here. So, you know, even if everything you're saying is true, you're still in a I pretty bad position. I need to put an extra level on you, but just those are the sorts of things that I really like to understand. Um, and, and I think this may be a question for, to see if Rafford, if you may. Your directory yeah, question. Sure. Uh, I appreciate that the current system mediation is triggered once the child is removed. Um, I suspect that we all agree that, in fact, it's a system failure if we're talking, that if we have removed the child. And so are you looking at models where, can we move this further upstream to have the appropriate intervention so that we're not removing children? That, it's just out of your area. Yeah, we get involved yeah. a little bit later, but uh, no, I think that that's absolutely something that we've talked about before, kind of pre-petition family group conferencing. Yeah. I mean, um, DCF knows if you're if you're getting to that point where you're going to say, "Yep, it ain't working. We've got to do something else," and it just seems that that might be the opportunity to yeah. step in rather than when we're doing this something else. So the answer is yes. We are definitely talking about the potential for using whether it's family group conferencing or even potential mediation in advance of an actual decision to uh, request that a judge order removal of the child. Okay, thank you. Um, I would just mention something about just the numbers in Pima County, which is where Tucson is. Um, you know, it's approximately a million people. They have 14 juvenile court justices. Ken mentioned they have 1,200 dependency cases per year. Mediation sees 1,100 of them. Um, and they do that with five mediators. So, you know, I think if we were to look at a pilot here, it's not, you know, it wouldn't be, you know, a huge staff increase. I think uh, it's, it's something that uh, we can look at and see how it's working and see if we're getting the results that we want. Um, so, uh, you know, it, 
this is this is the direction we went in. Obviously, it sounds like um, you might want a couple more options from us for December. Yes. Um, but uh, I think that this has a lot of potential. Thank you. Marshall Paul. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned uh, that there's a report from Arizona. There is a 2014 report, yeah. Can you, uh, can you send that to sure. the council? Sure. Good morning. Uh, so, in order to try to avoid just repeating what everybody else has said, um, I will start by just acknowledging that um, we're very supportive of the process up to this point. Uh, we have spent quite a bit of time since the legislative session ends and is doing really sort of, you know, the, the role of this Chins Reform Committee has sort of changed since the legislative session ended because now we are not only putting together proposals for Chins Reform initiatives, but also trying to implement the proposals that were funded. Um, and we've devoted quite a bit of time on sort of both ends of that uh, both ends of that spectrum. And um, I think for the most part, uh, people have really addressed the process up to this point um, pretty well, so that if there's questions about um, uh, you know, our office's position at, at, on everything up to this point, I'm happy to answer that, but otherwise, I'll sort of skip to the, the next steps question, and there was a lot of interest in the mediation proposal. That's something that we've been very interested in, largely because every t there's, there's multiple mediation models in child welfare systems around the country, and every time we look at them and every time we look at valuations of them, we're pretty amazed at the results that they get. They do, a, they, they almost always, almost every mediation type model, whether it's a pre-charge uh, pre model or a post-charge model, um, whether it's one that, that uses a family group conferencing model or whether it uses a more traditional uh, neutral mediator model. Um, all of these pro programs really very clearly result in outcomes that I think are better for really everyone involved. Um, you know, as Senator Sears says, these are complicated cases with a lot of intersecting interests. Um, but I think in the vast majority of cases, there's actually a real lot of common ground. Um, and I've, you know, I think one of the ways to look at it is uh, just sort of to see the potential that's there. Because when you look at how cases go through our system right now, and how many of those cases actually end in an agreed upon resolution, it, you know, we probably, we've, we've discussed this in our committee about how to come up with a percentage around that because nobody's really keeping statistics on it, but we all guess that it's probably around 85% of our CHINS cases uh, are adjudicated based on an agreed upon resolution anyway. But we spend an awful lot of time getting to that point. And because it's such an adversarial system to get to that point, I think that there's plenty of cases where we would have more engagement from parents, more buy-in from parents, and more time. This is, you know, I think really significantly, more time after the adjudication to work with the parents before you reach the point where you're looking around saying, how is this case going to end? Are we going to be able to reach some sort of a permanent conclusion in this case soon? Um, and anything we can do to speed up that process is going to pay dividends on that end of the process, where parents have more time, where families have more time, where the state has more time uh, to really devote to providing programming, treatment, and services uh, to allow these families to reunify if that's going to be possible. And I do think, uh, you know, as Senator Sears spoke to, there's going to be some cases that are too contentious to resolve through mediation. That's the case in any sort of mediation process. Um, but I also would say that I'm always surprised at the number of cases that are very, very, very contentious up until they reach that critical point right before the hearing and we manage to settle them anyway because um, I think a lot of times what is contentious is not actually, there's not a lot of contention around the facts of the case. Uh, a lot of times there's a lot of contention that's brought on by sort of hard feelings about how people were treated, how the case was brought, how, um, whether or not the process seems fair to people, and those are all things that are very, very mediatable and very, very um, 
I don't want to say easy because none of this is easy, but very, 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 very possible to resolve those cases in a mediated process. Um, so we're really hopeful about that, and I think we've seen around the country a lot of different small examples of places that are using mediation or processes like mediation to really good effect. Um, and so I think there's a lot of hope on our committee that piloting some mediation, uh, piloting a mediation initiative will really uh, give us something that we can then expand statewide, that we'll be able to look at it and see something that really works, see something that moves these cases through the system faster and with better results. Um, and then we'll have something that we could really grow. <laughs> With regard to after the mediation, is there data that shows you know, the long-term effect of these cases and how successful the families are after the mediation? There is, and I don't have it on the top of my head or in my hand, but um, a few of these have really been studied in great detail, and I know that they've looked at the long-term outcomes. Um, so I know that's out there, and I can try to find some and perhaps bring it the next time that we are up here proposing this. Two, two questions, um, and I, I'm going to get the words wrong, um, but I believe that when we were having conversations about pretrial pre services, there was concern on the part of, of the defense bar about revealing information in private session that could later be used. And, so the mediated process involves putting your cards on the table mm -hmm. at some point. Is this going to be an issue? Can, do you in, how are you going to resolve this, or is there an issue there? I think there will be an issue there, and it's an issue we will, we will resolve. I mean, I think every defense attorney is going to be wary when you propose sharing lots of information in advance of an adjudicatory hearing, and I want them to be suspicious and uh, nervous about things like that. That's what we pay them to do. Um, and it's our job to make sure that we put something into place that has protections, confidentiality, and immunity protections that allow that free sharing of information to resolve the case without um, turning it around and using it as a tool later. I think uh, one of the examples of where we've been very successful with that is in the youthful offender legislation. We have some pretty robust uh, use and derivative use immunity uh, in place for information that's exchanged as part of the youthful offender consideration hearing. And that was certainly something that uh, when we started introducing that to our people, to defense attorneys, there was a lot of concern about the information that would be shared in a consideration hearing process and how that would be used. Um, as people have gotten more confident about the immunity provisions that are in the statute, um, we've seen almost all of our attorneys get on board with it, and the ones that are recalcitrant, we will fix. Okay. We're trying to. Thank you. And, and my second question is, the Defender General's office has a small program, I think we give you about $60,000 that actually we gave to DCF that's supposed to give to you? It's about 150. 150. And that I think essentially does some mediation. No, it's not. So it's okay. That's all I needed to know. Was okay. No similarity at all. No similarity. No overlap there. Okay. Um, How much, from your perspective, when there are a number of children involved in one particular situation, then you've got to have a different way for each child at state expense, right? Not in every case, only where the children's interests don't line up. Okay. So just by way of example, um, if you have two children who are both young infants um, in a, what I would call a normal case. When I say normal, there's nothing normal about no. it. But the, you know, the cases that we see all the time where it's essentially you know, a family with drug involvement and things are falling apart. And then it's pretty easy to have one attorney that represents two children. I think the difficulties come up usually when you have two children and one of the children is accusing another child of having done something in the home or whether you, where you have two children 
Um, and this is a fairly common scenario, is two children who may have the same mother but have different fathers and have different interests in terms of where they are going to wind up because one may have a father available that they could with, with transition to where one might not, um, and that creates conflicts of interest where you can't have the same attorney representing both children. Um, but wherever there is no conflict of interest, then we do have the same attorney representing however many children are involved. I, I get confused by some of the things you told. It, I could see how someone could look at a case where there are conflicts of interest in multiple attorneys and be sort of shocked by that, but it's the rare case where that happens. I, I shouldn't say rare, not in terms of like, it's not like it you know, almost never happens, but it's something that probably happens in 15% of cases with multiple children, not, it's, you know, by no means the majority. The reason I brought children. that up, I would think that makes it, the mediation even that much more difficult. You know, I think that the amazing thing to me is how often, even in cases where there's a lot of different interests, where there's you know multiple children, multiple attorneys, multiple interests, um, there's so much overlapping. And a lot of times what mediation does isn't so much resolve the whole case, but resolve every part of the case that you can resolve and then figure out what is left that actually needs to be litigated or sorted out. Um, and so in a lot of cases, I think that the role that mediation can play leading into an adjudication hearing may, may not be to actually resolve the whole thing, but to get everybody to agree that like, oh, we don't actually dispute any of this factual stuff. We can do away with that. The real question is, and this would be true in most cases, the real question is, well, what are we going to do after this? You know, what is DCF going to be recommending? What are the and I think that in a lot of cases, the mediation process won't need to amount to, to much more than everybody sort of laying out on the table. Here's what we will be doing down the road. Here's what we expect to be doing down the road. And when everybody can have that kind of a frank conversation in a confidential environment, um, I think in a lot of cases there will be situations where parents will be willing to say, okay, I'm willing to admit that I sort of fell down on the job here and here. I don't want to admit to this other stuff. And I'm willing to do that because I've been assured that I'm going to you know, have a real shot to reunify with my kids. I'm not going to be, I don't need to fight every single thing tooth and nail at this stage because I have some confidence that at the next stage, there will be a recommendation that services be provided for me to reunify with my child, that this is not a case that's going to go directly to a termination of parental rights, something like that. In a lot of cases, it's just that kind of conversation that needs to happen in that sort of collaborative, confidential, privileged environment. Thank you very much, Marshall. Oh, what's that? Representative Shaw has so in, in earlier we talked about uh, mediation getting to a point where it just all of a sudden we settle and we don't have to go further. Can you expound on that a little bit? How, who's driving that, that bus at that time? Who's recommending settlement? Uh, and and how, do you, how, do, how do you get the, the mediator, the attorneys, the, the, the parents? You know, I think in general, nobody's really driving the bus. Um, it's more of the process really looks like everybody sits in a room and the mediator generally, and this is, I'm not, you know, there's multiple mediation processes out there and I'm sort of speaking to the more traditional mediation model that's used, in, you know, in civil litigation all the time. Um, it's really a question not of sort of trying to drive things to a settlement, but starting with let's identify what the actual conflicts are and let's identify what there's actually no conflict about, but um, people are fighting about nonetheless, um, and try to narrow it down to where there's actual conflict. And a lot of times that provides enough clarity to make it actually easy to reach a mediated agreement because when you, when you know, sometimes when everything's stripped away and you look at like, here's what we actually disagree about, it's very clear how that has to be resolved. Um, so I, I think that it's a process that's not so much driven by any one party as it is driven by the mediator having the flexibility and the freedom to sort of just go from party to party, 
kind of identifying where there's conflict, where there's not conflict, where there's overlap, where there may be some agreement that, you know, sits on some real small point of overlap that everybody can get on board with and um, that allows the case to, allows everybody to simply say, okay, I'm okay with that outcome. Um, and that may be something as simple as, you know, I mean, just, if you picture this, uh, you know, I mean, I, when I do this, I'm representing parents or children. I don't really see it from the, from the state side so much, but when you picture it from the perspective of representing a parent in one of these cases, you know, I don't, I don't often run into a situation where I'm representing a parent who's saying, I've not done anything wrong, everything about me is perfect, there's, no, there's nothing here, there's nothing for them to be, like, it's almost always a situation where there is quite a bit of openness to saying, look, here's how I, here's what I could be doing better, here's what I recognize I need to improve on, um, and simply providing the opportunity to do that, but also to give people the, you know, the ability to say, but here's the piece that I don't agree with, here's the process I don't agree with, here's the outcome that I really need to see that's really important to me, um, results in settling these cases. And I think that the statistics and the stories that we see in jurisdictions that have implemented these kinds of programs really are pretty incredible. I mean, I think that if we can achieve anything like the um, success that they've seen in Pima County, Arizona, or in um, some of the other jurisdictions that use these processes, it's going to be very much worth it. So, there is this mediation process. How, how much does the legal uh, crisis uh, errant in discussions? And are, are those cases able to reach the mediated agreement? Or the sure. I mean, I think that the the opioid crisis has given us a lot of cases. Um, I don't see the cases as being that much different than the cases that we had before the opioid crisis. I think that the cases that involve families that are affected by opioids really aren't going to be that much different in terms of what the outcomes are, how they are mediated, how they sort of process um, than other cases. I think, you know, as always, the real hang up that we have around the opioid crisis is when we don't have services available that we need, where everybody can agree, okay, we could resolve this if we could get this person into treatment, and right now, for whatever reason, we can't. That's always, you know, that's, that's I think, the one sort of uniquely opioid hang-up that we run into. Um, but other than that, I don't see these cases as being that much different from cases that we've always seen um, involving all kinds of things, alcohol, other drugs, um, opioids before it was an opioid crisis. Um, you know, it's, it's always been, you know, substance abuse and substance use uh, and the effects of it on families has always been a big part of the work we do and I don't think that that's any different here or in Pima County, Arizona or in any of the places that have been really successful with this, with these processes. So, one last question, I guess, so since, uh since we've recognized that we have a substance abuse problem and admitted to it, that you see these uh, maybe drop off and these type of cases coming before you? Um, I think that if you look at the statistics that were provided by uh, Judge Grierson, you'll see that there was a drop off last year. We see that reflected in our own numbers not quite as much because we keep track of uh, pending cases and rather than added cases, so we see changes a little bit slower in our data than they're reflected in the judiciary's data, which is added cases. Um, however, I also, um, if you look at the chart, you'll see that two years ago there was also a drop off, and I got excited about that one, but then it spiked back up, so I'm not getting excited about this one. Um, Fair enough. One last question. Um, you you said um, sometimes it's hard to get people into treatment. We've been we're being told that there's no waiting list and that everybody can get in tomorrow or this afternoon if they want to. 
What is your current experience? Um, I, I think that it has improved a lot. I don't think that that's true in every case, that there is no waiting list. We still have waiting lists here and there. But I think that a lot of times there's other barriers besides just the waiting list. Um, you know, if you have a client who really needs a particular kind of treatment because of, you know, if you have someone who has a job that they can't afford to lose, has a house that they can't afford to give up, doesn't have any supports around them, who can sort of prop them up while they get into treatment, then you're looking at somebody and you need a very you need treatment that's going to work with that's going to meet them where they're at. That's very available in some counties, and in some counties it's not very available at all. Um, so it's a real it's not just whether there's a waiting list or not. It's a and there's just, there's clients that I have who I don't know if I could find treatment that was appropriate for them, even if we had all the treatment and all the waiting lists. Um, it, you know, some of our clients are unique enough that they are going to be really hard to get into treatment. Period, because of you know, it's not just substance use. You know, in most of these cases, it's co-occurring disorders, it's substance use, mental health poverty, all kinds of factors that intersect, and sometimes some of those factors make substance uh, substance use treatment pretty inaccessible. Um, I appreciate that question. And I, I do think, I don't know what the appropriate committee is to look at this, but we should be doing an inventory of the gaps in our system. Uh, because I run into the same thing in Bennington. We're told that, no, it's not a waiting list. And we're told, no, no, it's two weeks. And then I'm told, well, this person can't get counseling. They can get the Suboxone, but they can't get the counseling. Or this person can't get this. I, mean, I don't know where it, where the best place is, but um, we need to start to grapple with this. Because we, we hear everything is great, and then it really is. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next issue is one that's, um, well, I think it might be the best kept secret in Vermont. Um, the, about three and a half years ago, I think it was, at Ken Schatz, um, Chief Justice Driver, myself, and Jay Diaz, and he said he went to a meeting in Austin, Texas, of the 50 states to talk about juvenile justice came back from that meeting with some ideas, and I'm working with House Judiciary, Senate Judiciary, um, came up with some reforms, including the youth offender changes to the laws and juvenile justice reform. And lo and behold, we find ourselves a leader in the nation. Very few people know that we're a leader in the nation because, you know, we're always talking about sex drugs and rock and roll, and juvenile justice doesn't make it to the top of the list. So I'm appreciative of uh, I, the other day, um, Beth Soswell, I've known for years. She, was, she is the Bennington District Director for DC. I have a special assignment right now. I don't know if I was supposed to get a copy of it, but I got a copy of the uh, update on the juvenile ju justice system, and it was a great PowerPoint. I read it over, and I thought it would be wonderful to hear from them uh, here. So that's what we're here for in this next half hour. So Ken. Well, I'm going to be brief because I appreciate that introduction that Senator Sears gave. In some respects, I, I had in mind very similar um, comments. So I think that I do appreciate the attention to the raise the age jurisdiction, that um, we will be the first in the na nation, as you I'm sure recall, as of July 1st, 2020, 18 year olds, except for certain very serious offenses, um, will uh, primarily uh, be uh, addressed in the family court as opposed to the adult court system. There is some potential for transfer for more serious offenses to adult court, but it is a incredibly significant change. I'm not going to be mindful of the time. I think you've heard all of that, but what, one of the things that we also appreciate that you did is give us some time to plan, uh, to move forward, uh, to make this actually work. It is a transformative change. It is a big deal, so I don't want to minimize the amount of work that's going on. We're continuing to, to do a lot of work with uh, uh, all of the juvenile justice stakeholders. As you may recall, you did ask us to provide a specific report on, on the status related to this change as of November. So just please know we are working uh, diligently towards preparing that report. We're also working very carefully with the Justice Lab out of Columbia University, which has
has uh, a national perspective on raise the age type issues. Um, it might be interesting to you to know that the Children and Family Council for Prevention Programs is actually having a day-long conference in, uh, on September 27th at the Vermont Law School, again, to give uh, stakeholders an opportunity to talk more substantively about this change and what changes need to occur to implement it successfully. But then I'll get to the point that um, Senator Sears made. We recognize that part of this change was thinking about how can, how can we really be ready? How do we reach out to others to think about what things need to occur to, to get ready? And we at DCF recognize that Beth Sawsville, as a, a, a longtime excellent district director in Bennington, had a, a wealth of relationships and skills that could really help us in terms of um, getting around the state, talking to people, and preparing some information that will um, influence, influence us as we make specific plans to get ready. So we did ask that uh, Beth go on special assignment, as Senator Sears mentioned, and she agreed to do so. And she has done some excellent work. And so I'm going to introduce Beth now and allow her to present that PowerPoint that uh, Senator Sears mentioned. Thank you. Beth, welcome. I think it's a good idea for everybody to introduce themselves. Good morning. Representative Maxine Brad and Morton, and I chair the National Street. Uh, Representative Bush Shop, and this is the Madam Vice Chair of the Presidents. Sandy Hodge from Rochester, Vice Chair of the Cousins. Representative Alice Simmons from Springfield, and the Chair of the House Corrections and Institutions. Dick Sears, Bennington County. And Mary Hooker, Ron County. And Mary Hooker, Ron Pillier on the Appropriations Committee. Skyler, I'm a student in general. So, um, good morning, and thank you so much for the opportunity um, both to come and talk about the work that I've done, as well as um, many thanks to my department division um, for the opportunity as well. Um, so what I put together is a PowerPoint presentation this morning to kind of highlight and summarize um, the work that I engaged in around juvenile justice in Vermont over the last um, several months. So I start um, first with a, um, this is a quote from, that was published first in the Bennington Banner um, about a year ago, um, based on an article that was written um, by Senator Sears and Vincent Schiraldi from the Justice Lab around our work and being um, the first state to um, address the issue of Raise the Age. And do I have... Do I have the ability to, like, I have notes up here, mm -hmm. like that? Oh. I see that screen. Uh, so is there a way to? Here and there. Mm -hmm. there should be. Oh, and by your temptation. Well, actually, I got the other one for Comcast. <laughs> Yeah, check your, check your signal. Yeah, yeah check your remote. Yeah, check your remote. Yeah. For technical yeah. difficulties. Yeah. 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 The Bennington Band has a wide circle. Just for those of you who aren't aware of it. So I apologize that, yeah, I had some notes to just further kind of explain some of the slides, so bear with me on that. Um, so um, this article also received national attention um, through the National Reentry Resource Center, through the National Justice Center. So... Um, I have some very cool transitions, too. Anyway, um, technology at its best. So um, 
um, Karen Bastine from our commissioner's office, who all of you probably know, um, has presented kind of um, these key pieces of Act 201 before, but we wanted to really highlight the fact that we've been doing a lot of work with our um, juvenile justice stakeholders to create a plan and um, that will be ready for you with the Justice Center and others um, this coming fall. So um, this has been, um, with these uh, pieces of the legislative tasks, has been a team approach. We have worked together um, tirelessly um, around trying to figure out how everything could and should come together. Um, Karen Vastine has been overseeing the implementation efforts and um, has been a wealth of knowledge. Um, our DCF central office staff has been heavily involved, um, especially with respect to absorbing new cases, given the current child protection caseload. Um, that was also, um, just to note, that was also part of um, Part of my, what I was tasked with was to look at our system and our current system, but also to have a lens of child protection. So because we're a combined system, so we didn't lose, lose sight of that fact. Judge Davenport completed the data review of 18 and 19 year olds with um, some very interesting pieces. Um, we have been working closely with the Justice Lab um, and operations planning. Uh, policy and operations planning. And my role specifically was to gather information from community stakeholders across the state on current resources available to this population. Um, how was this accomplished and what did we find out, you ask? Uh. Whoops. This is how we did it. So through community focus groups, um, statewide baseline education was provided around the definition of the emerging adult in brain development, along with engaging in a discussion around best practice and ideas for moving the work forward. So as you can see, um, we, um, I was able to uh, set up these community focus groups in all 12 of our DCF districts. Um, there was a, it was a multidisciplinary um, um, gathering of folks, and you can see representation from many of the um, stakeholders in the meetings that were had. And then the process was that um, each meeting included a brief presentation, which Senator Sears referenced, um, as being part of my local juvenile justice team in Bennington. Um, and we appreciate the pictures from Bennington. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's great. Well, it's great. I mean, it, it's a beautiful spot. It is, That's and it. I felt like it was important yeah. to highlight yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so the themes that were gather gathered um, through those meetings um, were consolidated and you know, teased out in different ways to look at the current system as it exists around um, resources and services. So what we concluded was that overall, our staff and community partners agreed that raise the age is the right thing to do, which really kind of provided a baseline um, sense of hope for us. And in addition, um, there's a desire, there was a real consensus statewide to have the resources to do it right. Um, there's a desire to make sure that we can do it in the best way that we can, that will, um, and that will require appropriate and maybe additional staffing and resources. the many meetings that happened, um, we um, came up with seven strategies for success. Is that Bennington Bar? <laughs> 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 Sure. I know. 
in 2027 that will be 250 years since wow. the Battle of Bennington. Will be the commemoration? Well, it will be. You'll be hearing more about that in the coming months. <laughs> We have some legislation for uh, <laughs> Representative Morrissey and I are combining it. Uh -oh. I think your uh, committee will hear a lot. Yeah, I think the committee will hear a lot about it. Thanks. Get a shot for me. So while we're just saying, Representative Devereaux retires, we're not going to argue about that battle took place. We have, we have actually had Howard Coffin down to finally Put, a, put an end to that and while Beth is working on the mic or working. The truth of the matter is, at the time, it was disputed territory between New York and Vermont. When we became a republic, part of the deal was we gave up that little section of Vermont to New York, which would have been helpful to Alice Miller to make it more different than Casbury. We tried to get it back now. Do you remember during your district thing, Alex Miller? Yeah, a little bit, you think? I'm sure you heard. Oh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's back. Now. So I'm back. I'm back for a moment. Um, so out of um, all of the meetings that happened, again, we um, came up with seven strategies for success. And these were recommendations generated by the communities in our state. The first of which was to strengthen the use of risk and need screening, specifically the youth assessment screening instrument that um, DCF currently employs. Um, we would recommend that DCF create a brief orientation training that could be shared with community stakeholders that explains the YASI, how it can be used effectively, its strengths and limitations, et cetera. We felt like there was kind of varying degrees of knowledge of the tool which was impeding some of the progress and use of it. The next one was to increase and support local collaboration. What we found was that in areas where the state's attorney and or deputy state's attorney that covered the family division have strong, committed, um, strong commitment to prosecuting cases in family division and have a good working relationship with their DCF, DCF office, best practice was easier to achieve. to cultivate um, juvenile justice specialization and expertise within organizations. So again, um, what we found was that um, to foster um, juvenile justice expertise within DCF, um, state's attorneys and community stakeholders to support current knowledge and best practices in areas where that was stronger, there was more kind of um, focused, um, good, pra best practice work happening. Number four was to share um, juvenile justice responsibilities among stakeholders. So when talking about raise the age, it requires a shared system of intervention to ensure that the youths receive the most appropriate intervention based on risk and that those supports and services are available. Number five was to utilize and strengthen diversion practices. So um, what the consensus was across the board was that folks ultimately um, want to see youth succeed um, and recognize that many youth could be served quicker outside of the formal court system, which is also supported in research, but also based in risk, and to figure out how to, um, how to, to have that happen in some areas a little bit more seamlessly. Number six was to enhance supports and services to youth by filling in or addressing current gaps in the service provision. So some of those gaps um, that we noticed that were pretty, um, uh, pretty wide were transportation, safe and affordable housing, 
It was noted um, in many areas the challenges with statutory timelines within the family division, you know, that currently exists. So adding an additional population was a concern. Um, more community centers that cater to older adults or emerging adults. Better tracking to ensure race, racial equity and availability, which you spoke to earlier, Senator, uh, availability of mental health services. <coughs> And then number seven was innovative ideas that could be scaled statewide. So a few that kind of bubbled to the surface um, in, this, um, in this work were engaging employers, um, expansion of circles of support and accountability for youth, particularly with uh, youth and the emerging adult population. Um, those have seen um, a fair amount of success statewide and um, many, if not all, of the districts spoke about um, wanting to increase that um, resource. Uh, peer panels and increased restorative justice education in schools and um, emerging adult mental health intervention. So um, I would wrap up with um, a quote by Eddie Cantor, who was a singer and comedian in vaudeville, he, who said, it's not only the scenery you miss by going fast, it, you also miss the sense of where you're going and why. Um, one of the things that uh, we spoke in many of the districts about is having, being appreciative of the ability to do some of this planning and having the time. We often, you know, often feel like we're trying to play catch up because of the um, expansive nature of our system, so we appreciate that. Um, and I thank you again for your time. And, and with the power and responsibility of innovation in Vermont. So. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Are there questions for Beth or Tim or about the process here and the beautiful pictures of <laughs> Bennington County, actually? I can give you a travel log on them later. If that's <laughs> you can see us now traveling now. Yeah. How, many, how many meetings did you have? You talked about different districts. How many? I, had I did it in all 12 of our, our districts, yes. Are there any rough numbers of the number of youth we're talking about? I know that corrections reports that that population is down, both probation and incarcerated groups. I think it has ebbed and flowed, and there again, I think that um, that has been primarily the work of the Justice Lab, and that you'll be hearing more about that in their operational plan in the fall. Uh, I have lots of questions about, so what do we do next? And are we going to hear about that? Well, in November, we have okay. the report due, right. but okay. I was so impressed with the PowerPoint that I wanted to get it before so, anybody so. else knew about it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It, was and it wasn't just the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> it was the information that we're actually, and you know, sometimes you start, you see something start, go through our committee process and then we kind of go on to the next important thing. And these folks at DCF particularly and others have been working on this thing diligently uh, since we passed the law about a year and a half ago. And I, I really do appreciate that that effort going on. I, hope the, uh, I know that in Bennington, Erica Matthews has been uh, helpful from the state's attorney's perspective and from the defense bar, uh, Marshall and his group, and I know Jeff Grierson, and particularly uh, retired Judge Amy Davenport have been act act actively involved as well as the, uh, the, it always escapes me the name of the group. Uh, the, uh, I think you mean the, the children. Children and family. Children and family. Yeah. Prevention. 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 Prevention.
you know, if you ask people what's going on, I don't think many people are aware of this change. And there is one thing that we need to do, and I don't mean to do it right now, but is I've noticed there's a lot of confusion about the youthful offender law and these changes, and we need to make sure that people are aware there's a difference between the two. And that was, um, that was addressed in the meetings that were had, yeah. but certainly it was a varying composition of attendance. I think there's a lot of confusion. Um, some, uh, you know, that's up to age 22, and there's some confusion that we're going to 22 for kids to be in PCF custody, and that's not the case. But. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to step out. Mm -hmm. Representative Evans is going to take over to uh, get an update, particularly on the judicial masters. in the, the current legislation mirrors to a great extent um, what the statute was originally designed for. This, this position uh, just historically uh, was authorized, I want to say, in the 2016 session, and it's never been funded. Um, so this is the first time that we've had funding and been able to move forward with the position. Um, but as I was uh, preparing for, for this morning's hearing, I, I look back at, at the history of of uh, what I had in mind in, in coming up with this position. And it really, what I envision and what I think um, 
the Chin's Reform Group envisions is there's a role for the judicial master clearly in this Chin's docket. We may collectively, the four of us, disagree on what that role is, and because this is in the nature of a pilot, we expect to continue those discussions to exactly how this uh, role, um, how this position will be used. Um, but clearly, the the, uh, the statutory um, language, as well as the language from the most recent bill, uh, describes in a broad context what this person can do. Um, we, as I indicated earlier, have decided on the Chittenden Franklin counties as a pilot for a lot of reasons. Um, and I'll try to explain those. But the first one, knowing that we wanted to have a multi county uh, pilot, um, the first practical consideration is having a judicial officer. Um, and the, the bill also provides for staff, court staff security is this physical space to locate a judge. And so the Chittenden Court and the Franklin Court, for different reasons, um, lend themselves to that more so than other. We considered other areas of the state, but the physical space requirement, obviously, to make this work was necessary. And so that was one of the considerations that drove that. But from my uh, perspective, and I think the, the others, um, there are a lot of reasons why Chittenden Franklin uh, makes sense as a pilot. Primarily, one of the things that Senator Sears noted at the very beginning of this morning are the numbers that are in Franklin County. Um, and there's been any number of times when I have come before committees and the question always is, what's going on in Franklin County? Why are the numbers so high? So it's not only a question of the high numbers, but when you compare them, for instance, to Chittenden, we really have two different cultures, and I think that's, again, what lends the, 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 the role of the judicial master appropriate to those counties. If you look at the numbers that, uh, that were provided this morning, the numbers are comparable, and if you look at the difference over the last two or three years, they, they kind of mirror each other. When one comes down, the other comes down, but when they go up, they go up. One of the big differences is that in Chittenden County, um, and I view this as a, a more of a cultural, and by that I mean the attorneys and the DCF folks and um, the court. A large number of the cases that come into court end up in what are called conditional custody orders. That's just the reverse in, in Franklin County, where there are very few of those orders. So I think this is an opportunity to find out what accounts for that, and is are we doing something wrong in Chittenden? Should there be that many? Uh, so it's an opportunity uh, to explore that. Um, but as I thought about what has transpired over the last few years since this position was created, it's interesting the number of times that the role or the use of a judicial master has come up. This was created, I believe, in 2016, and later in that year, uh, there was a lien analysis um, that we conducted on the Chins process. Now, there are certainly some that say that the, the Chins process doesn't lend itself to a lien analysis, but nevertheless, uh, we went ahead with it. And one of the conclusions in, th in that lien analysis was a place for a judicial master um, to play a role in trying to, a number of roles, prioritizing cases, uh, case flow, case management, um, getting parents to engage and keep them engaged. In other words, monitoring. So in a lot of respects, I think you can look at this role as um, at least treatment court principles of engaging early and providing monitoring that a presiding judge can't do. Um, does it mean more, potentially more hearings for the attorneys and guardians? The short answer is, in some respects, yes. Um, but we have to balance the need for more hearings with the idea that if, let's talk about parent-child contact, for instance. If that request is there, isn't it better, more beneficial to the family to get an earlier hearing on that parent-child contact than waiting six weeks before the judge can fit it into their schedule? So there are certain areas where I think there will be more hearings, but I think the, the need for those hearings balances out the demand that's going to be made on the attorneys and other players. Um, and, and speaking of parent-child contact, 
Uh, some of you may know from uh, the Justice for Children Task Force, we had a uh, study committee for, went on for more than a year to try to come up with a uh, parent-child contact protocol. Um, we worked very hard at it, but we didn't get to the point where we could adopt it primarily because of resource issues. But even the language that we used, uh, this is from an earlier draft, um, it says the benefits for children um, with parent-child contact include a reduction in the amount of time spent in out-of-home care. Uh, sufficient parent-child contact helps to maintain the parent's focus on the case plan. And it, it all, that if, is one of the key considerations in keeping families together. Um, and so we think, and I think, that the use of a judicial master um, can be helpful in that respect in, in maintaining, identifying families who are prepared to engage um, and, and monitor them. Um, and, and I think that, that is an appropriate role for the master. Um, a couple of things that, that Marshall mentioned um, that I think are significant. He talked about the importance of time to resolution. We settle all these cases, but it takes so long to get there. My hope is, with the use of a, a judicial officer who doesn't have the full authority uh, of a presiding judge, but can identify those cases early on where families want to engage and work towards uh, a resolution. And in the lien analysis, they talked about almost the idea of a two-track system where if you can identify those families early on and monitor them more closely, the idea would be that the case would be dismissed. Um, as opposed to just reaching an agreement. So again, in the lien analysis, in this parent-child uh, contact uh, protocol, it, it spoke to a, a judicial officer that could be involved in that process. Um, the other question, one of the questions you raised, Representative Shaw, was who's driving the bus? And in an earlier version of the legislation, and we think that the, the uh, judicial master could play a role in identifying those families that where mediation may be appropriate and, and send them to mediation. And when I was talking earlier about prioritizing cases, if we can get the attention early on, there are some cases that are just going to go to merits, are gonna go to hearing. Try to identify those cases and send them on to the presiding judge. Those families that want to engage and can engage, um, then those are the ones that we need to, to work on. And again, I think that's uh, a role for, for this position. And the only other area um, where, I, where I disagree, respectfully disagree with Marshall, he said that the problems are the same. You asked about the opiate problem, and I think anyone involved in this process would understand that that's driving these numbers. Um, the difference, one of the differences, I think, is the age of the children that are now coming into custody, as opposed to what we were used to um, before this epidemic hit. So they're much younger children coming in, and those are the ones that we have to try to get our hands on early on in the process. Um, and the numbers are so large that the courts are packed with hearing time. Um, and so we, we, I think this is an opportunity to see how they're doing things in Chittenden, see how they're doing things in Franklin, maybe make some changes, um, prioritize some of these cases, um, and it will devote, in some respects, more hearing time, but I think we also can take this as an opportunity. Is there another way to do this? Are, are there processes that, much like uh, this type of setting, where you bring the parties in, um, it doesn't have to be the formal setting of a courtroom and say, you know, what's going on and how can we steer this family uh, into, into treatment. Um, the other point I would make and why I think this is, what this position does is give us a great opportunity to pilot. Um, I know Representative Grad was on the Family Treatment Court Commission which again, in, a, in adopting, or I guess I would say the, 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 the possibility of that making a difference in this docket, one of the things that they considered was the use of a judicial master. Um, in, in some respects, because the idea is with this position, and you'll see in the, in the job description, 
the idea is to find people who have experience in, in substance and mental health uh, issues with families and we would be able to train them so there would be a consistency not only in training them but in their uh, role from one county to another which is lacking in the current rotation system. Um, so that, that Family Treatment Court Commission uh, also spoke to the judicial master and the final piece coming back to Chittenden and Franklin there is a group in Chittenden that have put together a proposal for a family treatment court and they have worked uh, very hard, very diligently in putting together a proposal uh, that has been accepted by the court um, and we think again in, in talking with them they recognize that a judicial master could play the role of the presiding judge in a treatment court setting. Um, as opposed to the judge who has to rotate in and out for a lot of other reasons. <clears throat> so I think for all those reasons, this it is a pilot. It, there's going to be some, um, I don't want to say mistakes made, but it's an opportunity to try different things with different cultures. When I look at uh, the Chittenden and the group that put that program together, as I said, they're very dedicated. Uh, at least they were when they submitted the proposal. It took us too long to accept it. But nevertheless, they were dedicated as opposed to Franklin County, which just recently uh, they have had what has been referred to as an adolescent court for the last 10 years, usually uh, delinquents in, in the juvenile setting. There haven't been enough referrals, either from the state or the defense, such that we're down to probably no participants in that court. So I look at that again as Chittenden, a community, and I know everyone says Chittenden gets everything, but if you have a community that has come together and said, we want this court, we think it can be beneficial, and then you contrast that with apparently what happened in Franklin County for reasons I don't know yet as to why would they let that resource go. So I think this is an opportunity to use this master in different ways from treatment court all the way through to uh, encouraging mediation and playing a role in, in trying to figure out which parents um, want to engage. Um, I think to go to your question about availability of treatment, my experience has been uh, if somebody is, is ready, we can get them in within a, a, a reasonable time to get them started in the process. But my experience with the treatment courts has been, whether it's a treatment court or just a, an informal setting, is if they're interested, you've got to engage them right away. You've got to get them to that person, and you've got to then make them come back and make sure that they got there. Uh, I mean, I learned the lesson years ago in my first experience with treatment courts, when you can be in the courthouse and you can say, there's the, there's the assessment across the street, and if you don't walk them across the street, they're gonna get to the end of the sidewalk and go left or right. So it, it's difficult, but I think this could be a vehicle uh, that could make that difference for a lot of these folks. So we have some questions. Sure, on that I didn't mean to wind on. How long is the pilot project for? Mm -hmm. Well, I was looking at that. A year, it, two years? It, it's got to be at least two more years because I think the funding goes through, I want to say, 2022, if I look at the... Just so we have that. Okay. So we have that Mary. I know. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Well, it's related to the funding yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. because we allocated 400000 mm -hmm. um, and it's is that what you're talking about over X period or? No, I think if you look at the budget, I, I thought I had it right here. Going back into the seven million that is kind of there broadly. Yes, but it, the way the budget and the projection for the budget, it would be 400000 for 2019, which already has gone by without <coughs> using any funds in this year, and then presumably it would be continued over the next two years after that. So that was my question. So the expectation is we'll spend 400000 in twenty current fiscal year in 20. and then we will then allocate another 400,000 for this one position and what else is in that there level? is there is staff yeah there is security to open the courtroom mm -hmm. 
uh, and there is, I believe it's in the budget, it's referred to as a, like a regional coordinator, someone to yeah. tie in what this individual is doing in both counties. Okay. When we get down to budget time, it would just be interesting to see. Right, and we will certainly have a better yeah. Yeah. understanding of how this person is being used, and uh, I'm, I don't know what the numbers will ultimately prove to be, but that's the way the money was allocated um, in the budget that we submitted to appropriations with the idea that it would have to continue in order to make this worth investing in, at least for the life of the, of the, uh, of the funds. Next thing. Can you remind me the hiring process? This, this is through my office. So it's not JMD or anything it, like No, that. It's not no. Like the magistrate. Exactly. Well, uh, the hearing officer. The magistrates do go through the appointment okay. process, so, so this is more like the hearing officer. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. I'll have others involved, but yeah. I'll certainly be involved. Any other questions? This is good. Okay. Thank you, Judge. I thank Representative Emmett for taking over for me. The subject is the uh, issue of the uh, mental health and um, what happens when somebody is found not criminally liable because of insanity. And David Cahill wrote me, and I appreciate David being willing to talk to us about a specific case. Um, and he may be limited in the, in the answer to questions we might have, but I thought that would help. And we're also going to hear from some victims. And this is, should be a, this is more centered on the victim's point of view in some of these cases. So um, go ahead, David. I think you're on the phone. I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking time with us. My pleasure. So um, I, I called in today to talk about a case uh, named Arnaldo Cruz. Um, I think I mentioned him briefly before. He's an individual who um, ended residing in Springfield, and he stabbed his girlfriend in the neck and killed her. Uh, and uh, he was charged with second-degree murder. Um, the ultimate disposition of the case was not guilty by reason of his sanity, which means who actually committed the murder, but he is excused from criminal liability because he was insane at the time of the event. Um, how did the verdict come about? Um, well, it's because both the defense expert and the expert retained by the state um, agreed that he was insane. And I, as the prosecutor in that situation, felt that I had no good faith basis um, to argue to a jury something other than what the expert there is a basis potentially to go forward, even when the experts uh, are in agreement regarding insanity. Um, in this instance, um, the parties agreed that the court could issue the verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity, which the court did. Um, and in December of 2018, Mr. Cruz was committed to the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health and was hospitalized. Um, he was then happened on a 90-day order because that is the longest order that is permitted by law. Um, the 90-day order included some provisions for victim notification and for notification to the state. The 90-day order expired and presumably uh, was uh, the subject of a new order issued in family court for continued treatment. I say presumably because I don't know that that I assume it occurred because Mr. Cruz had not been released on day 91. Now, the order for continued treatment does not include any of the notification to the victim or to me. So as I stand here today, I can't tell you with 100% certainty where Mr. Cruz is right now or where he's going to be tomorrow. Um, nor could I tell the victim that. 
of August 2019, it hasn't even been a year that he's been in the custody of the commissioner of uh, mental health. Um, and uh, we have already received word uh, through unofficial channels that Mr. Cruz is um, likely to be released in the coming weeks. Um, I say unofficial channels because there is no official channel to notify us. Um, and I know that I've said Commissioner of Mental Health a lot, and I am not calling to complain about the Department of Mental Health or to point fingers, because they are only following the law that we have given. And, and the law does not permit them to communicate with me or to communicate with you regarding Mr. Cruz in specific, or to tell us, or to tell me, or to tell the victims when he's getting out, um, which is why I'm finding out this information through a back channel. But I need to share it with you because if, if you don't know this is happening, you can't fix it. And you may not fix it for Mr. Cruz. And you may not fix it for the people who fear harm in his hand. Um, you probably won't be able to control what day he walks out of a facility, likely sometime in 2019. But I hope you can consider this information uh, in determining what the policy of the state of Vermont should be, what our law should be going forward, so that other families don't have to go through um, what the victim's family in this case uh, is going through. Um, so with that said, I'm happy to take questions. Again, yes, uh, this is Dick Sears, David, and thank you for being with us. Um, the first question is that, are even law enforcement able to be notified? But not officially. <laughs> do they know unofficially the same way I do? Absolutely. Um, and is, is there a scramble to try to figure out some legal means to continue him into custody of the state somehow? Absolutely. Um, so will that scramble, will that scramble ultimately be successful? I don't know. So. So he's being released into the community by the Department of Mental Health, and there's no notification to the victims. They might meet him at Walmart or the local store and run yeah. into him there. Yeah, and I'll stress that. And they're not even not, aware that he's out. Yeah, and I'll stress that I, this is not the Department of Mental Health's fault. The, if they follow the law, they will not notify the victim. They will not notify me. They will not notify the police. And that's exactly right. He could run into them just about anywhere. Do they even notify the local mental health agency? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I believe the law would probably allow them to do that if, uh, if certain criteria were met. So, Bobby, this is Allison. David. I mean, David. David. Bobby Sands. Bobby Sands, David Cahill, you look the same. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, oh, oh. Boy, talk about digging a deeper hole. <laughs> they do good work. <laughs> um, and now I lost my question. <laughs> directed exclusively toward victim notification and you're not suggesting that individuals should be detained longer than um, or be retained in the care and custody of the Department of Mental Health once they're found to not be a danger to themselves or others. So, I'm, Mary, I'm glad you asked that question because it, it, the answer is part yes, part no. Part yes, my immediate concern is victim notification, that they deserve to know that this person is coming out. Um, and frankly, law enforcement, law enforcement deserves to know that they can make plans to keep the community safe. Um, but as to the second part, you know, I, I came before the committee this past July and proposed that the initial order, the initial period of commitment for uh, a murderer who's adjudicated in pain should be three years rather than 90 days. And the rationale behind that is that many of the mental health disorders 
cause an individual to be insane uh, manifests themselves episodically. So it is not unusual for a person to engage in a period of intensive mental health treatment in a hospital and be clinically appropriate for discharge after some number of months. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to repeat a cycle that will have them back being insane sometime next year. Uh, and my point is that in cases as important as homicide, and only as homicide, it is worth that trade-off for us to require that that whole cycle of episodic behavior be observed in a secure environment in a hospital so that we're absolutely sure that this person has, for lack of a better term, overcome their cycle of mental illness before we put them back out on the street. So I remembered my question. Okay. Yes, sir, yes, sir. This is Representative Emmons. Emmons. That's right. I thought it was Wood. No, it was Wood. <laughs> Anyways, um, once the 90 days is up and then they're supposedly released, do you know if the Department of Mental Health um, looks to see if they have adequate or appropriate housing to go to? I, I, I don't want to speak for them about what their process is for determining that someone is appropriate to either release from the hospital or to step down to an order not hospitalization. I'll let them answer that. Okay. Skyler, I had a question. Okay. Yeah. Skyler, and then. Yeah, David, Skyler Nash. Uh, just going back to the case for a second, was there any indication prior to the stabbing um, that Mr. Cruz was trending towards being a danger to those around him? Well, in hindsight, yes. Um, hindsight being 2020, one could see him engaging in a pattern of escalating threat and just generally disturbed behavior. Um, and uh, but at the same time, Mr. Cruz in specific had had a history of uh, mental health issues and, 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 and those issues commonly causing him to come in contact with the criminal justice system in New Jersey. So it's difficult, it was difficult at the time, I think, to part of his behavior uh, on the one hand being a harassing of criminal intent to kill a specific person versus on the other hand just acting like the same paranoid schizophrenic that he had been known to be in his life in New Jersey. So I, I asked because um, I know I don't know if you're familiar, but in New York State with uh, Kendra's Law with assisted outpatient treatment, where they um, were able to find a way to um, get court orders for people. It sounds like Mr. Cruz, who might not necessarily meet um, that standard of imminent danger, but were able to intervene um, and get them assisted outpatient treatment before they became that immediate threat where they would be subject to homicidal behavior. And so that's been something I know um, Senator Lyons and I have been talking about looking at uh, if that was a program that we could better utilize here in Vermont. And it sounds like that somebody like Mr. Cruz with a history of that disturbing behavior, that could be somewhere we, where we could intervene, do a better job of intervening before he got his behavior reached a point um, where something like this would happen. I, I agree with you that, that ideally that would be part of the package that, you know, in a perfect world we wouldn't be here talking about Mr. Cruz having murdered somebody we would have prevented it through happen, for, from happening through mental health intervention. I agree. Oh, sorry. Um, David, this is Sandy Haas. Um, so you, you're talking about th three years. Uh, it's my understanding that commitment to the commissioner can include on an order of non-hospitalization. Are you saying that you want them in either the, the hospital or the um, or Middlesex for three years? <laughs> Right, right, because again, we're, we're talking about a very narrow population. We're talking about insane murderers. You know, that's what government is here for. That is why we have ability to block for um, I'm not talking about orders of non hospitalization where someone from halfway or APRS is going to check up on them one week, once a week. That, that's not going to do it. Um, I know we had the discussion earlier in, you know, back in July about, you know, it, recognizing the limitations of the Department of Mental Health facility, what the treatment providers are trained to do, it may be that you're looking more at a forensic unit that has some detention components to it. Uh, it, it, may not, it may not look like 
how how Middlesex looks today. What's up? Thank you, sir. David Butch, uh, back to the secure piece. Uh, I think you may have answered the questions. The secure setting, and I'm immediately comes to mind uh, the, our Middlesex type facility, uh, something of a secure residential facility. So, in thinking about stress on the system, uh, should, should this come to fruition for a length of time to be determined? Uh, have you been discussing this with uh, Sam George? Um, she and I have had had some discussions about this, and we discussed this actually in depth right before the uh, the just oversight meeting. So I um, she seemed to be she seemed to be voicing a similar opinion, but probably not as strong as yours. Yeah, I, I think there's a consensus around the state among prosecutors that. Um, the folks at the Department of Mental Health do, do a good job at the task that they're given by the law, but there's this gap in, in resources, that there, you know, that there's a need to protect the public by detaining and treating over the long term individuals who kill with serious mental illness, and that's not what the is set up to do right now. So you, you came up with a, a number of three years. Do you have any sort of, uh, is that just a hunch or is that any sort of data to prove out your statement it takes that long for them to uh, get through it? Well, it, you know, I'm trying to remember if I would ask this question last time, but uh, I, I knew that the answer did an initial order for five years, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and it, I, just having been under the gold zone a few times, I knew that the argument, this is what New Hampshire does, does not hold a lot of water, <laughs> um, which is why I did a the lesson for about three years. But it, there is a logic to it, which is just that there really is a cyclical nature to, uh, to violence that is related to many types of mental illness. Um, and I just want to make sure that we have the chance to have a few cycles go by before we let somebody out and they're going to kill you. I think there's two fundamental issues that are going on here that will need to be dealt with by the standing committees. One is, should the community and victims be notified when somebody's coming out? I mean, you know, I just read where there's two sex offenders moving to South Burlington. That's always the question. I mean, we dealt with that when we were doing the sex offender laws and how much notification and what does that do to people and stigmatize. The second real issue is, should there be a certain amount of time that goes by before somebody can be released? And how do we continue to know that somebody's still in, in the mental health field? For example, Elizabeth Teague, who committed a heinous murder in my district, um, we still know where, you know, where she, well, I don't know that I know today where she is, but you know, 20 years afterwards, we still knew she was uh, in, the, in the facility, and should there be a more formal notification? And how long should that be? I mean, there's, there's always a chance if you set three years, um, that'll be the default, and everybody will get out at three years, whether they should be or shouldn't be. So, I, you know, there's a lot of things that will need to be discussed, but I want to at least build what a bill would look like for me critical that the community be notified. I, don't, I just don't see, I mean, I understand um, one of the witnesses last time's comment about, well, they're innocent once that designation is made, but they're still representing a huge danger to the community. At one point, they've been found that they were guilty of this crime, but are innocent by reasonable sanity. So, I think those are the, the issues that have to be dealt with. And I have a question. If, if we go, David, to holding them for a period of time that's longer than 90 days, be it a year, be it two years, three years, you mentioned in a particular unit, is that going to be under the jurisdiction of the Department of Mental Health? Or is that going to be under Department of Corrections? Is that that's a question for you to decide because it's not a, it's not a clean fit in either place. 
um, this, this channel with Senator Sears just said, yes, these people are factually guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of committing the murder, but they're accused from criminal liability because of their mental illness at the time of the offense. Um, so it, one could argue that it is not humane and consistent with our system of justice to put them in a correctional facility. One could also argue that, you know, putting them in the, in the custody of the Department of Mental Health where the patient's interest comes first really gives short trips to public safety. There needs to be some sort of combination of the values of DOC and the values of DMH when it comes to how we, how we approach these people. I've got a, and I don't know where you're at. I've got a couple of witnesses uh, waiting on the phone. So, um, David, I really appreciate your uh, discussing this, and I'm glad that you did it and not me, because I was a little uncomfortable with um, repeating what you had written me in an email. So I well, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, now, our expert on telephones. <laughs> if you can call um, Jake Smith. You know, frankly, uh, 
should matter to the life of Catholics. Yeah. Um, and your, yours was the, one of the cases, your mother's was one of the cases that wasn't prosecuted in Chittenden County, am I correct? That's right, yeah. Questions? Well, we're, we're certainly looking at, from several aspects here, to recommend legislation for the mm -hmm. session to try to deal with this um, problem here in Vermont um, and try right. to look at what other states are doing, how other states right. deal with it. But it does appear to be um, there, well, there was, we just heard from the prosecutor in a case where the person was found not guilty by reason of insanity, which yeah. was a, a murder case that um, he's now, he's learned that he's being let out after a year. Um, right. And uh, he only learned it through the grapevine, not through any official capacity as a prosecutor. Um, right, and I'm, I'm not the part of that. Right. Um, and, you know, we're not the first case of these issues that have come up as well. Well, thank you so much, Jake. Appreciate your time. And I'm sure uh, the committee may be in touch with you in the future as we look at the legislation when it gets drafted. Yeah, I mean, I'd be, I'd be happy to help in any way that I can, and I would also be happy to just know um, what comes of it. I mean, if, if this kind of thing can be prevented in the future, that would be great. We'll try to make sure that Legislative Council gets in touch with you when the, when the bills come up for discussion in the, in the Senate of the House. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Joanne Ken. Without a continued information stream, 
The accused resides largely forgotten by the criminal justice system. Our family was quite proactive in seeking information for communication with the prosecutor's office and in turn would have had to contact the mental health facility or the attorney general to obtain whatever information they were able to provide. We monitored the duration of the hospitalization and medication orders and found in some instances that they had left without motions to extend being brought in the family court before the current order had expired. We were unsure what information, if any, was being provided to the prosecutor's office of the family court proceedings. We, of course, received no information. How much better would it be if someone from the mental health system, maybe the attorney general, was required to provide the type of notice to victims mandated to be provided by agencies under the victim's rights statute? I would note, I have reviewed the victim's rights statute, and mental health agencies are not referenced in terms of being required to provide any notification victims. The second point I wanted to emphasize is the lack of accountability of each system towards achieving the goal of restoring the accused to competency and bringing the accused to trial. The criminal justice system focuses on this while the accused is in his custody, but largely ignores the status once placed in the custody of the mental health system. The mental health system does not appear to have restoration of competency as its goal at all. Notwithstanding, like in the case of someone like my sister's killer, the individual in his custody is only there because he committed a crime. He would not have been otherwise committed civilly. He would not have met that killer. Um, so all the efforts in both systems seem to be on protecting the rights of the accused while ignoring the interests of the victims. The third thing I want to emphasize is that although there is a victim's rights statute, it is largely for this purpose. The stated purpose of the law is to protect the victims of crimes while balancing the crime victim's needs with the criminal defendant's rights. There are no consequences associated with failure to comply with these provisions as written. Moreover, once the accused is transferred to the mental health system, any rights the victims may have by statute are extinguished. You might be surprised to learn, as I was, that the victim's rights law contains a provision that refers to the victim's interest in speedy prosecution. Over our nine years in this process, this was never mentioned or applied. The fourth thing that I want to emphasize it's a matter of the mental health system in Vermont, Vermont not appropriately considering the safety of the public once the accused is in its custody. It is appalling how little protections were in place in respect to my sister's killer. Most of these we learned of through the press rather than through channels which would have provided us with information on which we could rely. I'm going to give you some examples of that. We were not informed when he was transferred from the correctional facility to the certainly less secure facility, to the certainly less secure mental health facility. We learned of behavioral problems um, through the press, including accounts of him collecting locks and, and putting them and leaving them in his room, and researching means of escape. Um, certainly, he would have acted on these if he hadn't been able to manipulate both systems so as not to have to be transferred back into the criminal justice system to stand trial for his crime. Uh, I, I hope you've read our account because, in that account, we describe the fact that Mr. Pedro was a transient. Um, he was, he had a lot of tools to live on his own. And if he had wanted to escape, I am fairly certain he would have been able to escape from that, from that mental health facility. Of course, he gave no reason to do so because he was never, he never had a stand trial and he was provided with all he needed within that facility. Ultimately, even at the end, no one outside of the mental health system, not even the law enforcement department, 
department was informed when he was transported to the hospital. One of the first questions we asked when we found out that he had had some sort of health issue, and of course because of PHI, we were not permitted to know what that was, um, was who is watching him? And we asked that question of the uh, victim's advocates who did not have that information. They didn't even know he'd been transported. The way we found out that there was no one guarding him was because we read it in an account in the Vermont Digger. So I have a few suggestions um, overall as to what I see could be improved on based on, on our experiences. Um, and the first one is to have the various interests quit guarding their own territory and look at suggestions across the board that can improve the process as a whole. The second one is to give sincere consideration to the rights of victims and quit hiding behind the shield of HIPAA and the like and provide information to victims that is not PHI or CJIS information. And, and there are plenty of that that was there that we should have had that was not, that would not be protected by those laws. Um, the addiction efforts should be made to address the parties excuse me, the case as a whole, the parties involved are only performing their job. I don't mean to denigrate anybody by that statement, but for us, this is our whole life. Once this event has occurred, this is our whole life. So we, we wait every second for some information as to what is happening in the processes. They need to consider that the lot, that lives have been irrevocably altered by the crime that was committed. As relatives of those who have been murdered, our only focus is to bring the issue to trial. So we urge that there should not no there should not be a continuing failure to others who are similarly situated. And, and plead that ultimately the system does not continue to fail the murder victim. There was no justice for my sister Kathleen, but we're hoping for justice for others. Um, I have nothing to gain from testifying to advocate for legislative reform. My sister chances are gone. She was brutally, brutally murdered and then failed by a system that should have brought her killer to justice. Um, I would also add that my sister was a very active in the community and very much in support of people's rights who have no voice. And, and I find it to be the ultimate irony that she ultimately, her voice ultimately was not heard, and her killer was never brought to justice. That concludes my prepared remarks. If anyone has any questions? No, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, Senator, I'm Senator. No, no. Representative Evans has a question. Thank you for your testimony and also for the written uh, testimony as well that came from the family um, at the time. Yes, my cousin and I prepared that. Okay. Just to give you a little bit more of an idea of our family, I'm a lawyer. My cousin in Ottawa is also an attorney. I have a brother um, who is an officer in the correctional system in the state of Pennsylvania. So we had many, many calls throughout the years related to the status of what was going on questions in terms of the timeline just so I can process this through so this occurred the action occurred in October of 2010 that's correct so the um, the defendant a call where was he located he stayed within a correctional facility 
upon his arrest? That's correct. And how long was he at the correctional facility before it went to uh, court trial? It, it never went to trial. Okay. How long was he at the correctional facility before um, the court determined he uh, was insane or could not? Was well, it, it wasn't an it wasn't an insanity. It was not competent to say. When? How long was the person? How long was he in a, the correctional facility before? So he was he was in the correctional facility until 2013. So he was, and, and that was a result of um, him. He, he was a very so during that he was a very intelligent guy. He he also refused to cooperate quite a bit with various counsel. I think he went through five or six different attorneys during this whole process. Okay, so he he was he was incarcerated until the court said that he needed to be at the state hospital. That's correct. So when that determination was made, where did he go for the state hospital? Because Berlin, um, Berlin was not up and running in 2000. No, and there was a problem with that too. In fact, the judge was quite angry about there not being a bed available for him once the um, competency adjudication was made. Um, but they did transfer him to, I think it's the facility in New Berlin. So, so when he was transferred, was it from directly from the correctional facility or was it from the court? Oh no, from the correctional facility. So he would have been transferred from a correctional facility either with correctional uh, officers or with the sheriff. That, that's well and good, but we were not informed that he was being transferred. So that's an issue. No. Right, so that's an issue. Okay. The family wouldn't necessarily, am I correct that the family wouldn't necessarily know why or when he was transferred? Yeah. And that was a concern to us because we were in the middle of conversations about when's he going to be moved and where's the bed and is there even a, even a bed available? But all the reason they moved him, they did not tell us. Well, at that particular time, and that's why I want you to know that timeline, at that particular time in 2013, we had lost our psychiatric hospital beds due to a flood. So I'm well aware of that. So uh, that's why I was curious, where was he put in the interim until the Berlin facility he, came online? He was kept in the correctional facility. They, okay, so that really indicates the communication. Part of the problem is, is that they have no way to know other than informally, am I correct? I mean, we, we knew a whole lot more than most people because we were, we were calling constantly or, or emailing constantly. And I would, I would want to mention, that would be remiss to not mention um, the role that the victim's advocates play in terms of supporting us and trying to get us connected to the information. They were wonderful. Other questions for Joanne? Joanne, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And I've had some correspondence with you, and uh, well, hopefully, this case will allow us to make some significant changes in the way we deal with this problem. Uh, can you let me know when the next, when the next step is going to be? I'm thinking well, that some the, of you will be passing next, some legislation. My guess is that the next step will be the introduction of legislation and then either a committee in the Senate or the committee in the House taking up the legislation and having, um, having it brought up. And I, I would assume that, you, you know, certainly uh, we can try to get um, you that information of when the bill is introduced as well as uh, any other information about committee hearings and so forth. Okay, that would be great, and I just want to let everybody know that I am retiring in January, and I would be happy to uh, appear before any of the either the either the Senate or the 
for the um, oh. house or the full body. Um, I want to try and make a difference for my sister. Um, it is one of the greatest losses for me that she, her killer was never brought to trial. And if I could do, if, if her name could stand for something, if, even if it's something small, um, that would be a great gift. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And the next, uh, I don't see Chris Benno here. Somebody from the victims. Maybe we messed up. Um, you never know, we do that once in a while on agendas. Uh, I was going to hear from Chris Benno um, regarding the victims' role. And it was nice to hear that uh, our victims advocates were helpful in this case. Um, we have, um, Is that, can I just, yeah, go ahead. I, I wanted to know that timeline of where he was because if he was under, he's being a detainee in corrections. So how much information can DOC share with the victims when the person's a detainee? I mean, that's, that's one way I was trying to get at, because maybe the person didn't sign a release of information. I mean, I, that's why, I, and then put them in a mental health bed if he came from a correctional facility, and I understand there isn't that communication mm -hmm. to the victim of moving, but corrections doesn't do any movement of folks without at least some form of law enforcement or their own correctional officers to move a person from a correctional facility. If they move from a correctional facility to the courts, the sheriffs do that move, and I would assume if it's from the court to the state hospital, it's the sheriff that's doing that move. If it's from DOC to the state hospital, at times it could be correctional officers. But it's that communication to the victim. But there would have been some security so, in the transfer. So how did he get, not physically get, but how did he legally get from the correction facility into state hospital? Yeah. Yeah. Wherever the bed was. The bed was. How was, what was is, the process? Was he just being warehoused in the correctional facility? Because you know that? Because, because well, we, he must have been warehoused because <laughs> he's an inpatient psychiatric folks were in correctional facilities right. until we get the Berlin facility no, up in front. Yeah, we still have we still do. We yeah, still have people who are seriously mentally ill who are incarcerated awaiting an evaluation. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, at what point, you know, that, that happens all the time right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that when they're with the Department of Corrections, there's a public notice and there's information. Once they get into the Department of Mental Health, that's where the public yeah. goes. Yeah. Notification goes away. Some privacy issues involved. I guess. I mean, but, the, but one of the things I'm trying to understand, there's two different cases that we've talked about. Today. One is where there was the finding that the person was uh, incompetent to stand, guilty by, by reason of insanity or incompetent. That's the Perizzo case that David Cahill was described. Then you have this case here, which Sarah George eventually dropped the charges after, what, eight years? Am I correct? So the guy was in custody, somebody's custody, for that amount of time, which was a lot longer than the three years that David Cahill's gone for, by the way. But at some, and then he died, so I don't know what would have happened had he not died, or what would have happened if the, the charges were dropped, so, but he wasn't released of it. Because he's still in the custody of no one. I guess we're all very. At sea. Very what? At sea. Confused. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's confused, but we've got a system that doesn't, if he were a juvenile, which we protect the identity of, we allow the victim certain information, but they can be uh, charged if they violate 
that you know they make that public information. So I don't know why we couldn't use the same system. <laughs> so we, we currently have what, two or three in Chittenden County that are within that 90 day window. I believe there's three cases that were dropped. Yeah, there you go. That they move, they move from the court system into the mental health system. I'm assuming, I'm assuming incorrect. Well, we don't know what happened. We don't know. What's the but one, is, one has moved back into a correctional facility because there's federal charges. Right. So she's now a federal detainee that's being Somewhere. housed in jail. Somewhere. Yeah. Perhaps we could have much counsel walk us through how the two systems work and if they can answer some of these questions in terms of jurisdiction. The only question I guess Representative Evans and I have is how far do we want to go in here versus forming the legislation and just letting the stand committees. Well, so if I may yep. in response Please to do. that. To me there are two questions that are on the table. One is notification of victims system-wide and how that is managed. And the other question is whether or not there should be uh, different management of people who are found to be incompetent to stay in trial or insane and not standing. I don't, I don't know. But those are your words. But those are two very distinct areas. And I would hope that we would treat them separately. I. I, um, I need to get a lot more comfortable with the issue around um, competency and how long people are held and, and held without being found to be guilty of a crime or in David's suggestion that they be held for a very long period of time because they may become unstable in the future. I, I just, that really deeply concerns me. I understand the argument and the issue that I'm concerned. Thus, wanting to separate notification, which I think has its own interesting questions, but there's a different legal issues associated with sure the game that we take. I'm sure other states, I don't know, Skyler, if you've looked at other states and what you've found, if anything. Yeah, I think one way to attack that is that it, the further we can separate the mental health treatment and, and services from corrections, it becomes easier because they can just handle that situation rather than us trying to put an arbitrary number of years on from our side with the state's attorneys and prosecutors and DOC saying, oh, three years or five years, just because they may do that. There are people that, that you know put them under the care of the people that know and don't have to put an arbitrary number of years that can do individual treatment plans to best fit those situations rather than us trying to put together uh, you know, a cure-all number of three years or five years or, or 10 years. And I know um, in Connecticut, they really utilized uh, Yale's uh, School of Psychiatrics um, to, to you know, the state owns their service, you know, center, but Yale and, and um, the Department of Mental Health are the ones that are running that, and so they're able to better uh, develop plans to individually, you know, deal with those cases. So, so I may be drifting into the weeds and maybe the community jurisdiction to figure this out. So it sounds like there's more than one track, two track, or even three tracks that we're talking about. Somebody that's, that, that's, going to trial, somebody that has is not going to trial but is being held for competency, and then the third uh, group of people that are just period not going to trial because the experts have declared that they were incompetent mm -hmm. uh, to understand their actions when the crimes committed. So it sounds like there's three separate and distinct groups of people that are also There's also one thing that was that Massachusetts has that we don't that's civil commitment. And so we try to Mm -hmm. Well, we looked at it, but you know, the reports are there. So, so going back to what you were saying, Sarah, about juvenile cases and what kind of information is allowed to be disseminated from right. those, we can look at that. Well, I think that's a real issue in the mental health field, and I think we get some pushback from well, yeah. some of the So again, uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I read years ago, and I don't know what it would So, okay, let me back up. So, not guilty by reason of insanity is, is this, like, old Anglo-Saxon, you know, it's not fair to punish somebody who didn't get what they were doing. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's real. It's, it's sort of, like, fun, somewhere in our morals. It's, it's, like, it's like punishing a one-year-old, or, you know, it's, it's comparable. But I have read that there's such a thing as guilty but insane. Uh, which, and I don't know if we can go there, and I don't know if it's constitutional, that that's, or be all kinds of questions around that, but that would get us over this, that would, the, the, the cases that Sarah George um, dismissed, you know, there was no question that those, that those murders had happened. The question was whether there was, was, was what, what we call um, um, legal uh, um, responsibility and anyway, because we're, we're talking, because I, I, I heard the question about public safety. And I think that, you know, in, in even, even the mental health commitment standard has a public safety element to it. It's, you know, it's danger to self or others. So if you are in fact a danger to other people, then, that's, then that meets criteria. So, so I don't know, I'm just trying to think about a, a way that we could differently frame it. And so and in terms of the victim notification and looking at, um, Juveniles, I think a ledge council or, or somebody could tell us, you know, why this is or isn't different. What, whether it's HIPAA and some of the other laws, um, what, what is allowable in terms of notification, and what, you know, what, what isn't, and what do other states do? I think mean, that's probably pretty much more straightforward. Yeah. Um, so we could get some help on that. We see that as these as two separate uh -huh. strands. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think so. Uh -huh. I think we just look at the notification. <coughs> well, I have to remember that I think part of the, not to continue on too far, but I think one thing we really need to look at is before, you know, kind of, I was trying to talk to David about getting before that serious crime happens, because a lot of this conversation is being framed of how do we deal with those people after they've committed this terrible crime? But well, we've seen in other states that they put the work into the front end of, okay, we have families that know that their loved ones are going down this disturbing path, but they're not quite to that point where we can order them to a hospital because they're not that high standard of imminent danger to everybody else. And so finding a way to help get them treatment to avoid having to come back around and say, okay, now that they've committed this crime, how long are we gonna hold them until they're safe? You can avoid a lot of these problems about you know notifications to victims if there's no victims in the first place. Well, you know, we're not going to solve this problem today. We may never solve it, but uh, we should certainly make an attempt. And I, when I used to run in groups that were based upon guided group interaction or something called reality therapy. And reality therapy is developed by William Glasser, which basically says. There's no such thing as insanity. It's your response. It is excuse for irresponsible behavior. And this course is an interesting concept, but uh, frankly, you think about it. Well, but that you know, you could look up Glasser. Psychiatrists believe strongly that, you know, basically, uh, huh. I've read many of his books. It's an interesting theory. Yeah. With that, we'll talk about press releases. <laughs> <laughs> my press releases from the Vermont State Police through Vincent Luthi. Yes, I do. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> but they're very helpful, actually, in you know, hearing about a crash or, you know, there's an interesting case up in, if you like, there's an interesting case up in the Northeast Kingdom of the guy in a wheelchair who assaulted people with his wheelchair. But that's, maybe we'll have a look at the time. <laughs> Bennington, who 
His concern basically is not that they have press releases. The concern is a press release about a person who may have done something and then that person is diverted in the criminal justice system and the, but the whole world knows what they did or accused of doing and they never actually had a day in court. But he called me and said, and then the word. Pardon me? In that case. Yeah, it's a place to the previous. Yeah. Yeah, this is all over the internet and it's facts. Yeah. Well, it could be. It could be true, but I'm just not yeah. remarking. And then we have several witnesses to speak to it, including noted journalists and my old friend. Who's noted journalists? This is the Senate, uh, no, Senate, this is the Joint Justice Oversight Committee. Sir, hold on, please. Hi, David Silver. Hi, David. Dick Sears and uh, the members of the Joint Justice Oversight Committee, Hi, David. plus members of the media and a number of other <coughs> individuals, including the Vermont State Police, local police departments, and others. So uh, you contacted Senator Campion and I about the um, press releases, and I thought it would be best for you to kind of kick off the discussion. Uh, and your concern as a defense attorney uh, for folks that have had press releases put out about them. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, so this came to my attention. I had a, a, a local uh, member of our community who's in his, I don't know, a family man who's in his early 50s, uh, no There was a press release 
uh, should be in favor of uh, at least waiting until the prosecutor gets a decision, makes a decision on how to go forward with the case. If someone's going to get the version, you don't know that after they're arrested. The prosecutor has to review the paperwork and decide to put the case into the version. If they do, then it becomes confidential. But if it's all over the newspapers, the confidentiality portion of it is really uh, undermined. And, and confidentiality is one of the major benefits of diversion. It's one of the reasons why we have a diversion process, is so that people who made a one-time mistake, you want to give them a chance so that they don't lose their job and they don't uh, face that kind of, uh, you know, and we live in small communities here and, and everybody reads the bad paper and everybody sees it. And it can be really damaging to someone, both personally and professionally. So, you know, I looked at the, at the guidelines and they're, they're pretty broad. I mean, it, it, Matthew Birmingham, the Vermont State Police, and he's got a couple of other 
Yeah. 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 This is an issue that's uh, first and foremost in, in our business every day. It's an important issue. So I appreciate the opportunity for, for allowing me to come here and speak about it. Um, just so you understand the state police's philosophy, uh, it's rooted in uh, transparency. Um, and we try our best, although not perfect, to be as transparent and accountable to the public. Uh, every day and we have um, a great relationship with our media partners and they are helpful in helping us push information out to the public. Um, what I will say is uh, in response uh, to Mr. Silver in that uh, I strongly stand behind our press release policy which you all have a copy of. Um, I do not necessarily agree with his philosophy. I think that um, what you have to do is you have to take an arrest separate from a court process. So an arrest does not mean that someone is guilty or innocent. They have a right to uh, trial by jury. Um, but an arrest is an event that the police do. An arrest of people for any crime should never be secret, ever. Uh, that is dangerous in a democracy and it's dangerous for police to be allowed to arrest people without notifying the public of that arrest, regardless of what crime it is. Uh, so I would strongly suggest that that is a, an avenue that, that we not go down. Um, as the head of the state police, I think it's uh, uh, incredibly dangerous. And, um, and I understand his concerns about diversion. I understand his concerns about uh, people, cases being dismissed. But when a case goes to diversion and or is dismissed, that doesn't mean they weren't arrested. They were still arrested. Uh, probable cause at that time was deemed by a, by a law enforcement officer, and they took somebody into custody and deprived them of their right to freedom. Uh, that cannot happen in secrecy, and it should not happen in secrecy. Um, and so we have a very robust policy. It is not a perfect policy by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, uh, we've worked on it for many years, um, and we have worked on it with a representative of the media who are here, who you'll hear from. Um, and I think it strikes a balance. Um, it is a living, breathing policy, so it, we, are, we are constantly looking at it. We are in consultation with our media partners. We're in consultation with our command staff. Uh, the governor's office has been involved in the development of this policy. Um, and again, it's not perfect. I, I know that the, that the media would like more. I know the public probably wants more. But we do have to strike a balance, as you'll see in here, uh, with some privacy issues relating to certain events that take place. Um, and, and we have a responsibility to protect investigations as they go forward, um, to ensure the integrity of those investigations, to protect the court process. Um, so we stand behind our policy. Uh, I do not advocate in any way reducing. Uh, the Vermont State Police puts out over 5,000 press releases a year for various incidents from things of, uh, down to speeding and, and driver's license suspended all the way up to homicide. Uh, you're welcome to join that media list if you'd like, if you'd like an extra 5,000 emails in your inbox. Um, uh, I'll just Mr. Uh, Donahue gets I'll subscribes to it and, uh, and keeps us in line on that, so I appreciate his, uh, his support. Um, so we try to push out everything we can through there. Again, we are not perfect, um, but we try and be as transparent and as accountable to the public as we can be. And I, I think that uh, we do a good job. And like I said, Mike keeps us in, on, in track and online when we're not. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. That's, that's where I stand. I, I don't want to go much further unless you would like me to. But One of the points that Mr. Silver makes and it is, it is a legitimate one in my mind, is when somebody's found not guilty, for example, mm -hmm. or uh, they uh, get diverted or whatever, th those factors are never, you know, never come out, particularly not guilty, you know, might be on page four, or the charges are dropped, you know, that, it's always the charges were out there. Now, obviously, if somebody's speeding 100 miles an hour, that's pretty hard to, Contest, but uh, you know that that happens so frequently, and that right. person is tired with that arrest for whatever the crime mm -hmm. is. So unfortunately, I a better question for the media about why. Right. Why is that pronounced? So I can, so what I can say is this: I can say that uh, for us, uh, the arrest is the public event that's taking place, and it's important for us to document that and make sure the public sees that arrest. 
Um, if, and unfor you know, fortunately or unfortunately, whatever side you're on, uh, the internet and the media and social media captures this and we lose control of it at that point. So it becomes uh, codified in the, in the World Wide Web. Uh, I understand that. Um, but that does not abdicate us from our responsibility to ensure that the public understands that we have made an arrest, regardless of the um, circumstances behind it. Somebody was physically taken into custody, and we have a responsibility to make sure that that is public information. Um, if it is dismissed, I, I would suggest then that you know the state's attorneys or the defense lawyer put out their own press release uh, to follow up, um, because uh, we do not do that. We do not do follow up. Uh, press releases from any event that results in conviction or dismissal. We, it's just not the role of law enforcement. Once the, once the um, criminal case has been transferred to the courts, it really is in the hands of the state's attorneys and the courts to manage. Um, and it's, it's not law enforcement's responsibility to come back and, and update the public on that process. So that's all I can really say about that. I'm not trying to punt by any means, but uh, I don't feel that that's the role of law enforcement. I uh, once, it, that, once it's I reached. appreciate your position, but I, I want to give you one other example that's sure. real life. But back from my days of working with troubled youth, by definition, of troubled, um, many times they love getting their name in the paper. <laughs> Actually, um, that was their notoriety. Uh, you know, gee, that I got arrested for breaking into this house. And, Look at that, I made page one or page four. Do we play into that too? Uh, so the question is if people- Well, I mean, I don't want to mention the name, but it's a yeah. case in Bennington that you may be familiar with, um, where I think it's notoriety also. It's, it's helping. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, we try and we try and with this policy, uh, and again, we're not perfect. I mean, we have over 300 troopers who each have their own brains, and you know, we try and keep them all focused on the policy. But uh, our goal is to ensure through our press release process that the public and the media are aware of actions that the state police have taken uh, in the uh, proficient, you know, the, the official performance of our duties. So, if someone's trying to take advantage of that. Uh, um, and you get notoriety, I, I guess we could, I, I don't know how we would handle that. If we're arresting them, we're gonna, we're gonna put their name out. Uh, if, they, if they like that, I, then I, I, but it's real. I, I, it is, I don't disagree with you, uh, but that is. Mary and then Bush. You, you've said a number of times that if someone's being arrested, mm -hmm. Then you're going to put their name out there. Mm -hmm. But okay, I, I get that. That's a, if you make a decision to take somebody into custody, something significant has happened. But just you know, just glancing through your policy, but it also says citations are, are, could be the basis. So mm -hmm. there are, it's kind of a, arrest is not the low, the low bar, the, the lowest. True. And so maybe it's a, a confusion of terms. Um, a physic, there's a physical arrest and then a citation, which we also deem as an arrest. You are charged, you are, although it is the police officer who's making the determination at that time, we consider a citation to be a non-custodial arrest. Um, so you are not necessarily, you are still, for the time that they are in your custody, they are not free to leave until they have been cited and released. They may have to have fingerprints taken, they may have to have their photograph taken. So there may be steps. They may have to be brought back to the to the barracks or the station. So there is a period of time where they are not free to go. So you are detaining them against their will and their rights, and you are serving them with court papers. So it is a non-custodial arrest, and it does fall within our list of criteria to issue a press release. So I appreciate the description of that, but to certainly me as a lay person, mm -hmm. again. Oh, you've taken me into your custody. I may be lodged. You know, mm -hmm. that's a big deal. I got stopped for going five miles over the speed limit, which is a citation. I understand that technically that's an arrest. Boy, that feels like it fits into a different standard. Mm -hmm. So I, let me, if I could just go a little bit further. So if you're there's there's speeding, which is a civil offense, and you can get a speeding ticket for it. Mm -hmm. um, which is not criminal. And then there's the criminal speed, which is excessive speed or careless and negligent operation or gross negligent operation, which is a non-custodial or custodial arrest. 
And, and I want to be very clear that uh, police don't determine whether people are lodged, judges do. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure for the record that everybody understands that. So if a state's attorney deems for whatever criteria that, that exists at that moment in time that somebody should be held, a judge will determine that. So, so for us, I, I completely understand what you're saying in terms of the, the perception of the severity of putting someone in jail versus giving them a piece of paper. But when it, when it boils down to actual process, they are being charged, they are being cited to go to court one way or another. They're going to court for a criminal, what we have deemed with probable cause is a criminal violation. So that's what I've just learned. Yes. So it's the criminal that's violation it. that is Correct. The, I haven't seen that. That's the underlying you, reason. You don't do press releases on us. So no. no, we do not. No, that's what I was saying. That would, that would increase it to 68,000 press yeah. releases a year. <laughs> so I don't think we could do that. We do a while. We do anywhere between 64 and 68,000 traffic tickets a year. That would keep kids busy. And just for the record, too, I have um, Adam Silverman, who is a longtime uh, employee of the Burlington Free Press and, and member of the media, who is now our public information officer for the Vermont State Police with us. And um, uh, um, Adam has done great things for the state police, just having come from the side of the media and um, opened our eyes to a lot of different things. But Adam was on the, the media side when we were when we were with um, with Mike uh, doing our policy. Um, so he kind of was, you know, on that side of it, and now he's on this side of it. And uh, certainly, if you have any questions of him, I, I throw that out there um, as well, just just to give reference. Representative Shaw has a question. Uh, Mary kind of stole my, she didn't steal my question, she read the line. But uh, because item 3.1 uh, looks a little fuzzy. 3.1? Yeah. Okay. Uh, looks a little fuzzy uh, for incidents of public interest. Uh, that leaves some, that, that, does that, does that, or does that not leave some discretion to the officer that's uh, putting up, putting up the, uh, so it, it does, and this is probably, you've honed in on probably the biggest uh, bone of contention between, um, you know, and Mike will speak later, between the media and the, and the state police is the public interest section. Um, you know, there, that is a balance for us. And so there's always a discretion. We've, we've reached the point, I mean, certainly if we have an, a crime we're investigating and putting out a release on the investigation would hinder our ability to capture a violent criminal, we're not gonna do that right away. So there has to be some discretion in when and how we put that out. Um, eventually though, if we make an arrest on a crime, that press release will go out. So there, there is a little bit of wiggle room there. The bigger, the bigger area is 3.4, uh, death investigations, and um, certainly it is probably it is the biggest area of contention between uh, you know the public's right to know and and the police's ability to manage privacy and investigations. And most of that is you know we we determine we go to all untimely deaths in the state of Vermont. So we are investigating suicides. We're investigating people who pass away in their homes uh, for various reasons, um, and we do not do press releases on those. Um, if there is no public interest component to them, because we believe strongly that those families have a right to privacy. If some, if something like uh, as bad as you know, God forbid, a child commits suicide in their house, or or their family member dies of natural causes in their house, we we try and strike a balance on that. Um, and there are other opinions to that. I, I fully respect that and understand it, um, and the belief that we should be putting out, anytime we're investigating any death, we should be putting that out to the public. So we have tried to strike a balance in our press policy, and that's, that's one of the big areas that we don't agree on. Um, and I, but I see both sides of it, and I understand both sides. So I want to back up to uh, Mr. Yep. Silver's uh, client. So from what you described and what he described, uh, it's safe. Is it safe for me to assume that his liberty was taken away from him for a period of time? Yes. Okay. Without, so it's it's was, taken away so the minute... No, nobody has said that yet. Okay, I'm sorry. It, the minute those blue lights go on, that is a, that is, becomes a custodial situation. Because under the law and recognizable by the courts, blue lights indicate you have lost your ability to decide whether or not you are, can do what you want. Because they indicate by law you must stop and you must comply. Um, so the minute those blue lights go on is the minute it's a seizure. It's, it's, it's signified a seizure under the law by, by law enforcement, by government. There's a seizure of that person in their vehicle. So when you stop me for 68 in a 50 zone, 
One thing I do want to clear up that he did say uh, that I think is important um, is when he was talking about public interest on, a, on our policy, the public interest that he was referring to is a definition. So it defines what public interest is in the rest of the policy. Um, so it's not, press releases are not necessarily issued for the public interest. They're issued if arrests like this list and that you pointed out in 3.1. But he was listing a definition. Um, arrests are different than what he was talking about. So I want to be very clear to, to make sure that you understand the difference there, that he was referring to public interest and, that, and as it's defined in our policy. But arrests are outside of that, anytime there's arrest. Because we arrest people, and he listed some situations, we arrest people all the time in their homes for, for many reasons, and one of the biggest ones is uh, domestic violence. And that is not, does not meet the public, ne not necessarily meet the definition of public interest, but it is a crime, and therefore a press release will go out for it, and because an arrest takes place. So it's important to understand the well, distinction. One thing that I would want to see is your officers having to make a decision whether or not they should issue the citation because it doesn't trigger a pressure release or not. And they do not. They do it based on probable cause and probable cause alone. And then, and then as part of their duties, they are to put out a press release after the arrest, at, within a reasonable amount of time after the arrest occurs. Are there any other questions from the crowd? It's kind of a Yeah, so um, when Mr. Silva was talking about uh, with the advent of social media and press releases going on, on Twitter and Facebook, and I see in 4.1 with the information that you all release uh, down to I, when it goes to mugshots, um, and I think a big part of that component where you, where you have that collateral damage to somebody that's been uh, put on social media and you see that that's one of the biggest things that you see spread through social media and that mugshot. Just for my understanding, what is necessarily the um, public interest in that mugshot being kind of spread through social media and all the press release? So the mugshot is uh, for, it's, it's for us. It's part of an arrest record. And then, the, but therefore, it becomes a public document that, that um, is part of the arrest process. And Mr. Donahue will explain to you later that that is, as a result, it becomes a public document. It is for public viewing. So, and he's not wrong on that. It is, we, have no, we have no legal justification or reason to withhold a, a, a photo that we have taken documenting an arrest as part of our processing of people um, that becomes part of, that becomes a public document during that process. There's no, no, there's no exemption for that. Not necessarily to say to withhold it, but I think that just the way that you know, social media is set up, that mugshot then becomes what is the face of that press release rather than necessarily the information. And so even in a case where somebody might, that issue might be resolved, that mugshot being spread along Twitter and, and Facebook is what's going to come up when, when they see that. And that kind of, I think, is where a lot of that harm can come from when you're talking about collateral damage that can follow. And, and I understand that. I'm not, I'm not dismissive of that. I, I completely understand that once we put it out, it is beyond our control at that point. Um, but I still do not believe that that that, that uh, you know, that how it travels through the world after we release it should, it should any way reduce our ability or our, our responsibility to be transparent to the public. Um, I, I think that that, that is too important. Um, it is too important for police to make sure that they are being accountable every single day to the public. And we do that through transparency and putting information out to the public through press releases. Um, I would be very leery, if not a bigger word than leery, to say that if we were, you know, if it was ever suggested that we arrest people and not put out press releases and wait for a court process, that would scare me. As the director of the state police, uh, I would be very uncomfortable with that. Um, I, you know, it reminds me of countries that take people off the street all the time and nobody knows why. And we do not want to be, we do not want to even get close to that kind of, of system. So. That's as, as strong as I can say that I think that it's a very dangerous situation. Is there any way that we can still be transparent while also, um, you know, 
uh, evolving to match the the, nature, the new nature of social media in terms of you know we're not withholding information and we're and we're not getting anywhere close to taking people off the streets and we don't know what we're mm -hmm. handling but also being um, you know cognizant of that thing times have changed in terms of the yeah, advent of social media and and still providing that full transparency and not withholding information but maybe adjusting the way we disseminate that information so that it reduces that harm. You'll have to talk to them about that. I don't. Once I mean, we have no other way to make it public other than to give it to the public. Um, so, and, and I think that uh, for us, for us, I can only speak for the state police. I mean, if there are other conversations about how to how to disseminate it once it goes past us, for us, it's important to ensure that the public has it, and that's everybody. I mean, anybody can get on our media group. Um, the media gets it, and so I. I I don't know how else you could make it public by not pushing it to the public. And then I do want to make a, there's a, an important point. Uh, we do we do work with the courts and with uh, um, you know people who have had their cases expunged and or dismissed to remove them from our press release block. So we we recognize that that sometimes cases get dismissed and expunged, and we we will work with them to have those removed. Um, so, you know, we have no interest, for the record, we have no interest in shaming people or, um, you know, making people look bad. That is not why we put these out. It is not, it is not to say, hey, look at what we, we arrested somebody. And, and shame, it is, it is strictly for transparency, the law, the Constitution, and making sure that we're held accountable. That's what it's for. Well, oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Just a really yeah. quick question about the mugshots. Are sure. they released in every incident? No. Uh, there are situations in non-custodial arrests where they are not taken um, because they're just, we don't have the technological capability to do it. But if you take the mugshot, it will be released in, in a press release? Yes. Thank you. Appreciate Chief it. Taylor, John Alden, thank you for making the truck down. Thank you for having me. I concur with everything the colonel says, obviously. Uh, I've been in law enforcement. representing the yeah. police force. Yeah, so I was, I just came from a police chief's meeting, and I'm here to represent the Vermont Chiefs of Police. Our press releases are based on um, the law. So in the, Ver in the Vermont Constitution, Chapter 1, Article 6, we can all read for ourselves that we are agents of the government. And it says in there, in essence, police are enjoined from withholding from the public or from the news media the names of persons cited or arrested or from withholding the names of the offenses charged against such persons. In addition to which, there was a Supreme Court ruling. Justice Dooley wrote the opinion in 1990 following uh, a challenge to the Vermont State Police on a DUI case. Um, and in that opinion, he said that everything that the police do is a matter of public record unless it's statutorily protected. Because we are the government that our Constitution protects us from. Um, and they reaffirm that citations and arrests are public records. And the mugshot is part of the arrest, which makes it a public record also. In addition to which, if you take a look at the Salmon case in 2010, and the court ruled on that. That was for, for the video. auditor of yeah. the house, not the government. Right, right. I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you take a look at that case, you'll see that even all the video recordings we make, the dash cam, the body cams, for those of us who use that, that is all a matter of public record. And unless it's statutorily protected, we release it. Um, I would tell you that in over 40 years in law enforcement, there's never been a time when the police have been more um, challenged to be transparent and to be accountable. And, and I support that, as you heard the colonel say. Um, I support that. I have 30 officers. We make 1,062 arrests a year in St. Albans, and we take 100 public inebriates into custody. We do not issue a press release on every case. And the reason is I'd have to have somebody full time just doing press releases. Um, but we would never withhold that information. Um, so for example, uh, we don't issue press releases for shoplifting incidents. However, if the media called and said, did you arrest Joe Blow? And we looked up Joe Blow and we had, we would release that information. Um, and if we have a mugshot, we would release it. We too are in situations sometimes where we don't get the mugshot. 
um, uh, or a picture, whether you call it a mugshot or not, a picture at the time of the arrest. So I would tell you that all of the chiefs are unanimous in their position that they are complying with the law, the U.S. Constitution, Vermont Constitution, and high court decisions. Um, and that's why we release it. Um, I have been challenged about releasing those things and they do end up on social media. Again, I have no control over the press release once it's issued. Um, and, and by the way, if they go to diversion, they are guilty. Somebody has decided that a smaller penalty or punishment might be more appropriate or some other act of reparation may be more appropriate than going through the court. But I heard a lot of talk earlier about, you know, if they go through diversion, you know, uh, or if the case is dismissed. If the case, even if the case is dismissed, it doesn't mean that probable cause wasn't found when they were arrested. Um, it means that a state's attorney who is free to prosecute at their will doesn't feel that they could prevail in a trial. So there may be any number of factors associated with why a case goes away. I would like to tell you that I've never arrested anybody who was innocent. And I hope I don't have a single person who works for me who would do that. So obviously we believe that they're guilty of a crime at the time we arrest them. And thus, arresting them makes it a public record and our actions are reportable. Yeah, the only thing I would say, Chief, is that the uh, Innocent Project would probably disagree with. Yeah, I suspect uh, they would. There, but... there's a, well, there have been a number of cases where people who were convicted of murder and um, other violent crimes have been found to be not guilty through DNA evidence. That, I agree with that. That wasn't available to your office when they, when those, well, I'm not saying to anybody from St. Albans, but I, um, one of the most powerful witnesses I ever heard was a person who had been uh, sent in 18 years in Massachusetts jail for a rape that he didn't commit that was proved through um, DNA evidence and, um, and when, when we were talking about civil commitment, one of the problems, Massachusetts has civil commitment and he couldn't get out of jail because he wouldn't admit to the crime he didn't commit. Yeah, my heart goes out to people like that. Well, because he, he refused to admit to a crime he didn't commit. So. So, I mean, just, yeah, I get it. And, and with all due respect, sir, I'm saying yeah. I have never arrested well, I, an innocent I person. That, and I, and, I and you never do. And I hope none of the people that work for me have ever done that yeah, either. That uh, one question, I, and I should have asked the Colonel too, victims. It's, I always read where the, the press chooses not to identify the victim. Do you give out the victims' names? Not in certain crimes, uh, domestic like assault domestic and, and uh, sexual assault crimes. We do not release victim information by policy. So the press doesn't have that. Then they don't get it because I often read that you know, free press doesn't. I'll use the free press. It's okay. I don't hear anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'll often read the paper where the, this paper doesn't print victims' names. And I'm assuming that they had the name, but that's not part of your press release. The sexual assault, that's usually the newspaper's position. The domestic assault, the names are public record through the court records and everything. It's just that the papers oftentimes don't. But it's not it was, part of the There was at least one, that one case that they did back for domestics and relief from abuse orders for quite a while. As a, Way to alert the public about it. Well, that's a good segue. Are there any questions for the chief? Yes. So we've heard from state police. We've seen their public release information policy. What about the members of your association? Do they have written policies such as? Well, I would have to check with each department. I assume that there would be different variables of the the policy, but but what they wanted me to relay is their policies are based on what I told you. So you want to check and get back to the chair. Sure. Do you want me to check with each police department? There are 54 of them, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one outlier isn't going to do you any good. Uh, and then, you know, the policy is, is, is probably the safest way for you to go, my assumption. You don't have to do it tomorrow. <laughs> well, thanks, sir, because i got quite a lot on my plate already. <laughs> I, it would be helpful to know if there are any that don't have. Um, I will double check. That would be, yeah, that would be just an email to the association. Yeah. Any of the, yeah, right. yeah. I'll do that. 
great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, Mike Donahue, without further ado. <laughs> Infamous. Executive director of the Well, Mike has been too many things. Over the year. I'll say this Mike has been very helpful over the years for the number of bills in the Senate Judiciary that I appreciate his counsel representing the press. As you, you're the executive director. I'm, I am uh, Mike Donahue, the executive director of the Vermont Press Association, and I worked at the Free Press for uh, 47 years. and do some freelance work periodically uh, for some papers, including Bennington, Brattleboro. I've noticed your byline. <laughs> so I wasn't fully sure uh, of the specifics of what this whole hearing was about until I heard uh, David Silver. I, I do find it it's sort of interesting that uh, to hear a lawyer and he's not fighting on behalf of the Constitution for Vermont or New York or Vermont or the United, the United States and that I'm here arguing on behalf of the Constitution. But, uh, you know, it's sort of interesting, but... Duly uh, <laughs> noted. And, and there was some reference made also that, you know, whether the police have to check with the prosecutors to figure out whether this case is going to be public or not. And I gotta say, proudly that I've been pleased in Vermont that for the most part, police, prosecutors, and even the medical examiner are independent of one another, <laughs> and that they're not in cahoots with one another. And so if the police make an arrest, they're making an arrest, and they can leave it up to the prosecutor to figure out whether they're going to honor that citation, whether they're going to send it to diversion, whether they're going to uh, prosecute it to the fullest extent, or, or whatever. So. That is part of the Vermont system of, you know, of independence and everything like that. Um, and there are big cases that sometimes happen that do go to diversion. Uh, I can think of one recently within the last year or so in the town of Essex where uh, a farmer was in for animal cruelty. 24 dead cows on his property and it was a horrific scene and nobody had ever seen anything like it. And it was all set for prosecution and then suddenly it went to diversion. And, but there have been several stories about that whole case, and then suddenly, poof, it went away. So, uh, and I did want to respond to one other thing that I think that when a defense lawyer is representing a client, he's representing them not only in the court, but in the court of public opinion too. And that their job is, you had my client on page one, I just got an acquittal in, in the jury trial. I hope you'll put him on page one tomorrow. And I've gotten calls through the years from lawyers saying, I got my client off and I expect it. And, and I've had arguments with my editor, although Adam was always behind me. If we had it on page one, if we had it on page one, I said, we owe it to this gentleman to have it on page one for, for uh, him being exonerated or, or, or the jury not finding him guilty. Um, I guess the, the, the thing that struck me about the the, the guy who was David Silver uh, talked about that went over 100 miles an hour, uh, I guess probably twice the speed limit down there. I, if he's on Route 7, it's 55. Uh, 55, where he, you know, so. Yeah, I drive that a lot. You know, <laughs> that's actually where I have where my tickets from. <laughs> <laughs> it was a symbol. Was it the constable? <laughs> Actually, going to be put in the St. Joseph College Hall of Fame. Yeah, that was on the way down to. Made for an expensive weekend. So, um, but there is value in the information being put out there. If your 15 year old daughter says, oh, yeah, you know, whoever it client was. Mr. Donahue is going to bring us to the Rutland Fair. And you've read two days before that I was pulled over going 100 miles an hour. You're probably going to rethink that position as to whether your daughter is going to get in a car with that guy. You know, so um, it's about allowing the public to know about offenses. Um, 
<clears throat> and as much as it may be a pain for troopers and for legislators and for the governor uh, or other state employees to have the public looking over their shoulder, that is the government that we have. And it may not be perfect, but I haven't seen one that's even close to one. And I'm pleased with the kind of government that we do have. Um, just to give you a little history, uh, when I first started, it was what was called cop calls every day. And one reporter would be assigned to calling various state police offices. And I got to talk to your mother for 35 or 40 years every morning. <laughs> Something butch. <laughs> You know, the calls would be, hey, it's Mike of the Free Press, so what do you have from overnight? And she would tell us what were the important things, or you would want to talk to the station commander or the detective or something like that. The press release policy that is now in effect is a way to establish that all cases are handled even handedly. And, um, Jim Baker, when he was the director of the Vermont State Police, went to the FBI Academy, came back and told me that the most impressive class that he took was media relations class out of that whole three months down there at the FBI Academy. And he had a lot of good handouts that he shared with me. And he said, I'm going to make the State Police the most transparent agency in the state of Vermont. And I think he's pretty close to what he ended up doing. And Colonel Les Franz, when he took over, continued that policy. Colonel Birmingham has continued it. And I think we need transparency within the Vermont State Police. Um, the press releases go out. They're on a form, just so you know, if you haven't seen them. Uh, the troopers, after an accident, you know, can be sitting in a U-turn in, in the interstate and fill in the blanks, and they can have a, a fatal accident out within three or four hours after a fatal accident, instead of trying to have to return phone calls to all the TV stations, all the newspapers, and everything like that. So uh, it, it is pretty easy uh, to crank those things out. Is it perfect? I agree with the Colonel. No, it's not. Uh, we have a few complaints about it. Uh, we're going to be working with them. Uh, the detectives, we find, are a little bit lax in putting out the press releases. You know, is very strong in, in getting their arrests and, and other things out. Um, I would say, I don't know if this is a place to say it, there was two hours of training at the Vermont Police Academy in the basic class, when in fact, even when it was eight hours, and, and either I'd do it or there'd be a panel with like Marcellus Parsons and and a radio person myself would go in and do a two or three hour class. Somewhere between the eight hour class and the 16 hour class, that has been eliminated. And we would love to see how the media gets handled, or how to deal with the media, and everything like that. Because there's a lot more media, and people roll up in an accident scene, and suddenly you've got a camera in your face, and you know, can you tell us true for what happened or something like that? And I think the police ought to be better. Some of the, mm -hmm. that would be good. Um, can, can I just, I don't know, just say one thing? Yeah, um, he's referring to it, correct me if I'm wrong, like the uh, Criminal Justice Training Council Basic Academy. We have a separate state police component that does include a block of media that has coordinates and that he brings media. Correct, including my company, my very first guests. guests or troopers. Yeah, yeah. So I want to be good. Maybe, uh, maybe speak to Rick. To the I will. I'll talk to Rick. I, I, uh, and I don't want to speak for him or the council, but I want to make it clear that the state police. I mean, I, it may be that we put so many training requirements on the well, council, they've lost time to do some of the things they used to do. And that's one of the things I think I've heard is that. Well, yeah, back then we didn't have to have now we're required eight hours for this, four hours for this, for this. Violence training and suddenly so eight hours is now uh, six hours. And, and, and I, I, he is correct. The state police do have 
but it's the sheriffs that don't get it, it's the local police that don't get it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've got other questions. Mm -hmm. well, you know, I'd like to expand on my question about victim. But, um, is it particularly domestic violence? Um, and sexual assault and those types. Is, is it up to the individual uh, newspaper or press organization, or is it the... Um, for the most part, uh, I, for sexual assault, um, I would say to say every paper of one, because there's roughly 60 papers in London Daily, about four dozen non-daily. So, like for all of them, my belief is that their policy is um, that they will not identify names of sex victims, uh, sex crime victims, uh, without authorization, without speaking to them. Some, some people have uh, authorized it and their names get published uh, during interviews or whatever, and some choose not to, whatever. Domestic uh, assault uh, is a little different. Uh, the names are public through the affidavit. I think a lot of papers don't, but that's not to say that some some may earn it uh, through the affidavit. The people just don't leave them out, actually on their form. Uh, but uh, uh, I had an editor once who actually said. Uh, when people start reading or start reciting what the free press policy is, and the editor would say, "Our policy is we have no policy," and that—that's we're not going to lock ourselves in. If pick a high high official suddenly gets involved in domestic abuse, would we report that case? Yeah, we probably would. You know, if it was a the Russian delegation, the governor, the deputy governor, or something, the cabinet, or something. I don't know. Every paper does things differently. But I, I won't say we'll never. It was like suicides. Uh, I mean, personally, I think that suicides are underreported in the state of Vermont. I mean, the early journal say they don't give out suicides. And, and when I see how many people do die from suicides, and, those are all brushed under the carpet because we don't want to talk about it. But more and more people have approached me that have been have families with suicide that have said, "I love to see you do stories about suicide." And, and people, uh, I know it's tough that they say, "I just didn't see my brother doing it." And I just, I mean, I got a nice note because you know I was on three sex abuse. Uh, yeah. And all that. I got a nice note from somebody who wrote me and just said, uh, thank you for your work. I'm sorry my brother didn't hang on. He committed suicide two years ago. And if he had just hung on, he would have seen this day. And it sent you to me. You know, so I, I, don't, I think suicide is an underreported news story. And, we can uh, debate that at some point. Yeah, it is. I've even seen obituaries trying to explain that the person died suddenly, died suddenly and trying to explain that it wasn't from a drug overdose. And, and, and uh, actually, a good friend of mine just, her son died. And, and she, initially, she, she showed me the obituary and it was about to go on the paper, and I said, you may want to say that he had heart attack. I mean, he was 31 years old. Yeah. He was, you know, because yeah. everybody's going to be saying yeah. he had a drug overdose. Yeah. You know, yeah. you may just want to say what the cause is. Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Are there any questions from Mike? Um, I really appreciate you coming down. Maybe, maybe if you can't give lessons to the police, maybe you give lessons to the it's legislators. Us. <laughs> <laughs> he gives us lessons every day. <laughs> Some legislators are very fluent in the press.
Nobody's looking at you, Senator. Oh no, I didn't mean you. I thought you were talking about I got less than four from Vince. No, no, actually, you know, back in the Bennington Banner days, they were they were pretty dogged reporters. They gave you lessons. When I first got there, they Right. Well, like Rob yeah. Wilmington, we know now. Right. You know, but Rob was a reporter in Denton. He was a top reporter. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all very much.